What's up and welcome to another episode of the Scott and Ian show on the SBL podcast. But today we have something totally different for you. Scott and I sit down with the legendary bass player, Yannick Gwizdala. We talked to Yannick for about two hours. It's a fascinating conversation. If you don't know Yannick, he is, of course, a bass player steeped in jazz vocabulary, a fantastic band leader, educator, content creator. We talk all about it. And we actually have some very different opinions on what it means to be a content creator versus an artist on the importance of social media. Yannick has just gotten rid of all of his social media. I couldn't feel more differently about how I engage and love social media. So it was fascinating to hear his take. As for me, I came up loving Yannick and not even so much the records and his music, but just his online presence. Like, I didn't come up wanting to play jazz or transcribe Brecker solos. I just was, I loved that there was someone out there that did, right? I would watch his content and be like, wow, this dude is going for it. Very, very opinionated and just interesting. Like, transcribing Brecker solos in real time, not slowing it down. I mean, right, very, like, sticking to his guns. It's something that I have admired for a very long time about Yannick. We talk about that. We also talk about him diving into pedals. I ask where that comes from. He was very inspirational to me on sounds, the sounds he makes, the pedals he uses, right? We talk about his instrument, his new F bass. We get into the weeds and Hey, look, it's three grown men, me, Scott, and Yannick Wisdahl, all about the same age with some very, very different opinions on the trajectory of education, art, content creation, and music. You're in for a wild ride and a treat. Before we get to that, let me tell you what's going on at SBL this week. We have a mentor session coming up on Monday, March 27th with Ariane Cap. She's talking about how to turn one simple drill into five cool applications. If you've never checked out Ariane Cap seminars, you got to, you'll learn a lot. She's an awesome educator. Now let's get over to that interview. How are you, uh, how's the, uh, the bass dad going? I was just thinking about it the other day, cause obviously you became a bass dad, right? Bass dad. <laughs> <laughs> how's the, uh, I mean, how, I, how's the, could how's the fall sleep as, going? I could fall asleep right now, and that would be no offense to either of you or to this <laughs> podcast. I could just literally put my forehead on this microphone and sleep oh, for a week. Did anybody a pre-warn you? Did anyone? Yeah, yeah did anybody I mean, pre-warn you? Yeah, I, I, you know, like you, you guys both have kids, right? Yeah. No, dude, you don't fucking know. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> People that, well that's what I was going to say. But, no. like, oh, Jesus. It's like, well, it's like everything that they warn you about. They warn you about yes. the sleep. They warn you a, a list of 20 things that everyone kind of agrees on. And you never know until you know. Yeah. And then you really never know until you have to go to work. And you have to be a musician and yeah. you have to try and practice and go in the studio and God forbid, leave the house. Yes. Like I'm road yeah. guy. At least I was until I had a kid, you know, and that has been, oof. Like, how, how is it he or is it she? Is it she, like how, Lily? Yeah. Daughter. How, how long are you in? Uh, we are 15 months and one week right oh, now. Oh, you're well so, in. Oh, no, like, yeah. Your feet are right under the table. Yeah, like I have to, I don't know about you guys, like you might have not gone through this yet, Yannick, but you will do in the future. You'll have a friend or somebody that you know, you'll see them online and they'll be like, oh yeah, we're having a baby and stuff like that. And and you'll be really pleased for them. You'll be like, oh, awesome. But yep. a small part of you will be like, oh, dude. So the, 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 well, the crazy thing is that right now, uh, both my drummer and my uh, piano player and my engineer all had kids within three weeks of each other. Amazing. Oh, wow. So everyone in my band has a zero to one year old kid, basically. Oh, that's and cool. My, my piano player Amazing. has a 19 year old and a 17 year old already and went for number what? three what? and he's older than me. Yeah. <laughs> But the, and I was the, like, but was Tom, drunk, you were almost a drunken, out. Night. <laughs> no, no, no. It was very, very cute, beautiful second wife and second family, the whole bit. And yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Like he's, and he's way into it. It wasn't an accident. It was totally planned. And I'm, I am, like you said. Sorry, Tom. <laughs> su yeah, exactly. Super happy for them all. And, uh, yeah. but yeah, it's amazing. Like just the conversation you have. Like they asked me advice. My engineer, especially Juan Pablo in, in Argentina. And he was like, man. Yeah 
you know, I think I'm perhaps losing my mind a little bit and we're going very fast, very fast, very fast. And I don't know what to do. And as soon as the, the daughter came, it's like, oh, well, that's just a different life now. Yeah, yeah. That's right. it. it doesn't, that nothing matters. Like all the things, he's, same for me, I'm sure the same for you guys. As yeah. soon as it happens, you're like, oh, this is it now. Yes. Like this is a completely different trajectory. We, t we turn left and we never look right again because this is another framework, another parameter that is just a 24-7 a necessity. You know I, I mean? remember having yeah. this experience of playing a gig after uh, my first daughter was born. I have a daughter and a son. I remember playing this gig, you know, so we're back home and now I'm on the gig and I'm playing. And I just sort of saw myself bird's eye looking down at this piece of wood and metal and plastic that I thought it used to be the most important thing. You right. know, like, oh, the just the amount of time and energy and money into this instrument. And I just sort of saw it for its components in that moment. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is a this is a piece of wood. Uh, object, with, right. Uh, an yeah. object, yes. Yeah. Instead of this, you know, personification of this thing. And uh, it was a really good perspective for me. It was a huge perspective shift. In, and, in that sense, I think I prepped myself well for being a father. I, st I just started selling bases. So they weren't <laughs> even in my periphery. I was like, okay, this one can go, this one can go. Wow, what did you yeah. sell, Yannick? What, what all left the, what left the Guizdala household? All my Federas. Wow. Yeah. How many Foderas left? Zero. Well, I'm saying how many oh, no, how many sorry, did you sorry. sell? Not yeah, yeah. How yeah, many yeah. are left? How many left the house? Yes, three. Yes. three. I had like the original one, the darker body one, um, from like twenty something years ago, and then the signature one. And I also had one of those like P base things, the monarchs, the four strings. Yep. Oh, yeah, sure. And crap ton of yeah. diapers there, right? You got like that's a lot of diapers. We're, we're, yeah. we're covered. We've got two years worth have, of diapers. Here. Oh, two years could have had three more kids, put them through college. I mean, like, like yeah, no yeah. joke. And like this video, I I recently like started to reboot my YouTube channel and t take it in a whole different direction. And one of the first videos I I put up was about that kind of story, yes. about that trajectory of that. And yeah. um, boy, do people like drama and a story and controversy and always uh, you know always, always. why oh yeah, why because it did really well right oh but like by far my best performing video out the gate since i've had a youtube channel since 2006 i mean bonkers i, I kind of wish i hadn't done that one as soon because now nothing measures up to it <laughs> <laughs> it is man the, the content game i mean we're always thinking about that at sbl of like you put out a monster video and then it's hard or, or something even that you're not uh, anticipating pops pops and then now what it's a it's a blessing and a curse right when yeah, having my bang. emotional and my having my emotional health tied to an algorithm is yes. it's brutal isn't it and it's yeah i mean if, if yeah if that's really what it is that is if, if that was what it was for me it would be a problem it's more like um I, well i think that like influence and uh attention get more sort of kudos and support than maybe creativity now so it's super easy to fall into yeah. like oh this isn't doing well this isn't my number one video this mm -hmm. month like, i posted one this morning in fact it was on auto post because i finished it last night and it's like number three now i see so many interviews of youtubers and they're like mm. if this video isn't number one i might even pull it down and just put it in the trash or oh, dude, just, I'm, like, I'm happy if it's in top five <laughs> and for anybody listening so what happens when you upload a youtube video is youtube kindly <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah really they, kindly they so kindly give you a um, a top 10 so when you publish a video within around an hour i think of it being published you oh, no. will see five minutes oh five minutes oh that's so <laughs> they're nice screwing the, the the knife in the heart like five <laughs> minutes after your thing goes live they yeah. really like nah. yeah exactly so you publish the video and then five minutes afterwards you will see where that video is sitting within the top 10 of the last 10 videos that you published yep. and many times many times yeah. it will not be in the top five and sometimes it's like eight or nine and it is um an interesting i, I think like i am it does like obviously like we've all done it for a long time here like yannick you've been doing it for over 10 years in fact just before oh, i was yeah. uh, sitting in my kitchen um, being very British, eating sausages uh, with ketchup. And, Where's my uh, jar of Marmite? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit, I better do some research. And I was like, when when was your first album released? And it was 2004. Four, yeah. And I was like, holy shit. It's a lot. That's, That's like, a long time. 
It's because in my mind, I was like, oh, it's, it's like a decade ago, right? It's like 10 years. Yeah, <gasps> right, right, right. Almost, like, almost 20 almost, years ago. Yeah, it's 19 it's, years now. Almost yeah. 20 years ago. So I think it'd be really cool to get into, you know, how... And my, my point is, we've been at this game, not only for yourself, obviously you've been releasing yeah. music, but also releasing content as well online to promote that music for yeah. a long time. Um, and I think that um, I am definitely, and I'm not sure about you, like even I can tell myself what whatever story I, I want to tell, but when I see a video sitting at number eight and it's Saturday, I'm like, oh, you know, and and I've got my kids and my wife's out yeah. doing something. I'm looking after the kids and I have to tell myself, no, you cannot change the thumbnail. You cannot change the title. You've just got to <laughs> do your thing. It's hard, isn't it? Not to, you know, not to fiddle with things and and not to well, yeah. let it let it affect you. And I say that with a, you know, I just. At the same time, I'm certainly not sort of like crying into my pillow. And it's not, I don't get to my, you know, at the end of the day, I'm sort of like bummed out by it. But it, it and it definitely has got better over time um, mm -hmm. and a lot easier. But it is, it's definitely something that I like to bring up when talking to other people in like that within the YouTube game who have been through that experience of like, oh, how's it performing? <sighs> well, I, I got to say that I'm only f as 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 long and you are so accurate about the timeline and how long it's been. And I've had a YouTube channel. I'm probably same as you, like since 2006, since YouTube yeah. was a thing. Right. I'm only four videos into ever looking at analytics. Wow. Is it sort of like four a, videos, a new thing? One and a, six weeks. I started January 1st. I said, this is where I, and I've just erased all social media. So I have no Instagram, no Twitter, no Facebook. I've never had TikTok. Um, or a, any of that. It's, it's all gone. You cannot find me there. Um, so that was the move. Like, cut out all the noise from the micro blogging, attention seeking, you know, time wasting, scrolling sort of platform things. Again, my, I should have prefaced everything. It's my opinion. Like, take it or leave it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not, you should do this. It's not, nothing like that. It's just my experience that I speak from. So I did that. And then I was like, you know what? I've had the YouTube channel the longest. Um, uh, it's something I love to do is make films and I like music and film together and how do I exist in that framework to turn that into a community which uh, translates into live music. I don't care about ad revenue, I don't care about the little number with the box that grows and grows and grows to 50, 100,000, million, whatever. I do care that that number gets bigger so I can go sell more tickets on a show because since day one I've played live music. I've always played live music until the end of my life. I will play live music. So that's the catalyst behind it. Um, but with that comes, mm -hmm. like you said, the, the the visual of seeing those statistics happen in real time. You know, literally dropping my daughter at daycare, the video has been live for 45 minutes. And before I drive, I'm looking at YouTube studio, seeing where am I at here? How many Mr. Yeah. Beast interviews have I seen? Have I really like dialed in the concept and the framework and the pacing and the retention graph and all mm. of those things. Mm. Not because I want to be famous, not because I want to have influence, not because I want ad revenue or money from my YouTube channel, but because I know, especially when you look at someone like an Adam Neely or Rick Beato, that chain that translates to ticket sales and having a, a community in real life. Oh, opportunity. Um, IRL yeah. as I think At the bats. kids say. <laughs> yes. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, and, for me, viewing your content for years and years and years, I've always wondered how you thought about the combination or juxtaposition of content creator, artist. Because I did. sometimes you, you never that's thought why about it. Was, that's why it was unsuccessful. And I have, I've sat at the same number of subscribers for, I don't know, look at Social Blade, probably years at this point. You know, uh, uh, the, the whole daily vlog thing. Like I was, Jojo Mayer, I moved to, I'm running around here. I moved to New York in 2000 and uh, Jojo Mayer, for anyone who doesn't know, one of the world's great musicians, actually, he's a, mm. obviously a drummer, but one of the world's great musicians and musical thinkers and innovators. And he said, yeah, Yannick, it's like, I'm fucking 40 years too late moving to New York. You know, I moved in 91, you know? Dude, the impressions he's not quite Arnold Schwarzenegger, but he is <laughs> Swiss German. And I, yeah. I, was, I was getting there in 2000, like, you've been here almost a decade and you were 40 years too late. Are you fucking kidding me? Mm. Like, what am I doing here? Mm. So that to say that when I got to the daily vlog, I was once again too late. Mm. 
Nobody wanted to live. Casey was winding his thing down. Casey Neistat, that's where I got the idea from. He was winding mm -hmm. things down. My videos weren't getting views. Um, so to, uh, to, to your point, Ian, I have not thought about mm. the success of it or art or this, that, and the other. I use the daily vlog as an educational tool for myself to learn how to make videos and mm. be a better editor, a better storyteller, and how to have focus and discipline. For, well, for anybody listening, I, I want to get into the daily vlog and everything. Because like sure. when you started doing that, I was like, I'd done not a daily vlog, but I'd uh -huh. actually done vlogs. I was over in New York for a couple of weeks on a project, and I'd vlogged every day when I was over there, edited it While myself. you were working. I freaking knew. Yeah. It's like I'd stepped into the volcano. I put my foot in the in the in the lava, and I knew how freaking hot it was. And yeah. just to take it back to when we were talking about the kids before, and seeing you know people that I know, friends having kids, and I'm like, oh, you don't know. When you did that, I was like, oh shit! Like I absolutely loved it for the spirit of it, and I was like, how? Because because it was brutal when I did it. It was brutal, yeah. and no sleep. Mm. How long did you do it for? Uh, consecutively, 314 days. Are you serious? Yeah. Every single day I didn't miss. And I think in total, <clears throat> there are maybe 380 episodes. Wow. But I stopped even calling it a vlog or, or being around that concept like before the pandemic. I mean, I think I might have uploaded my last one in 2019 okay, and like it. called yeah. it a vlog. I thought I, I half-heartedly relaunched. And I was like, oh, vlog season two or something. And I, I'm going to do it once a week on Wednesday. Bullshit. Mm, you know, okay. it was just, it, you know. It's so hard day, to do. Yeah. Can I thread day, it? I'll, on, yeah, I'll thread sort of like, I'll, I'll connect the dots to some people because they might sure. not sort of like understand sort of like some of the bits and like what a daily vlog is, for instance, right? <laughs> so I think that's, and we'll get into this. What I really want to know from you is your take on what it was like um, when you when you released that first album, how you were thinking about um, building a following, creating a brand for yourself and all of that good stuff versus, mm. you know, 10 years forward versus another 10 years forward, how you feel like that. But yeah. just for anybody listening in, what, what you'll hear us talk a lot about is, you know, content. And you might be sitting here listening to this thinking, what the fuck is Yannick doing daily vlogs for? Or why are we even on YouTube? Like, what is that for? And the reason okay. we're doing that is, to Yannick's point earlier, um, is to create, to, it's a conduit, right? To take people from here to something else. It's, you're gathering people, you're creating a tribe around something that you love, yeah. um, either a passion or something that you love speaking about, whatever it is, you're creating a tribe. There was a great, a great book around about it. Called, written Seth by Godin. Guy. Seth Godin wrote Seth Tribes. Seth Godin, Tribes, yeah. Kevin Kelly, Thousand True Fans? Thousand that, True Fans, Kevin Kelly. Thousand, yeah. right, okay, so, on my so they wrote nice. great books on it, and the premise was you create these true fans, these tribes, they will love what you do, mm. and then you can use, or use is maybe not the right word, but you can, um, you can... You, you leverage that. You I'm leverage like, their trust. I'm like, <laughs> you, use you, capitalize. I'm like, leverage. You leverage that trust. <laughs> yeah, yes. To to in your yeah. case, sell albums, do shows. Like maybe not sell albums anymore because you know music's free. But you know, do shows and all of all of that stuff. Right. Put a, put a pin in music being free because we I'll definitely should talk about, talk about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. For sure, for sure, for sure. Um, so that if anybody's listening, you're thinking, why, why are they even, you know, this is a music podcast. We should be talking about bass. The, the reality is that this is now how people, you know, create tribes, create, um, these thousand true fans or I mean, you know, Yannick Scott, I think last time I looked like 70, 70,000 people following on YouTube. Um, so that's what's, that's the new space that we live in right now. And what Yannick did, um, a couple of years, I think it was a couple of years ago, he was doing this thing called the daily vlog. It was actually really popular at the time. It was popularized by a guy called Casey Neistat. Huge. Six years ago. Six years six ago. Six years ago. <laughs> yeah. See, I'm just dreaming. My timeline of the past is just sort of like, Kids, everything's within a sort of like, yeah, three year period. But yeah. there was a, a, a vlogger called Casey Neistat who uploaded, I think something like 800 and something. 800, yeah. Daily, yeah. daily vlogs. And he was just out outlandishly good like 
a one in a one in a seven billion kind of yeah. individual, mm -hmm. and and he was a filmmaker, and he's also brother's a great filmmaker as well, and um, and this whole kind of like vlog style of content was born. I capitalized on it, on it a little bit for about six months on our channel, and honestly just freaking burned out on it i was like it, this isn't sustainable and i wasn't doing it daily i was doing it right weekly weekly over about five to six months and i say five to six months maybe adventurously maybe it was more like four months but it was it was really tough and it was not in my opinion scalable at least for me yeah. um, and then yannick maybe like after i'd done it maybe like even like a year or two years after that and casey was still obviously huge doing his thing you started doing this daily vlog and that's when I was like, oh shit, is, it, is this sustainable? And I, to be honest, I didn't know which way it was going to go. I just thought this is either going to be awesome <laughs> and you're going to, yeah, well, sometimes you've got to take freaking big swings, haven't you? And I think it was a big swing and, and freaking kudos to you for taking the swing, but I didn't know which way it was going to go. From an audience perspective, I didn't know whether they were going to love it or whether they weren't going to be, you know, bothered by it. Um, and I wasn't sure, well, I was pretty sure how it was going to go for you. It was going to be brutal. I, I just didn't know whether it, whether it was going to be sustainable or not. But yeah, yeah it, like it was really tough. And it, it, but like anything, you could insert any pursuit. It doesn't have to be the daily vlog. Just take bass playing, for instance, in mm -hmm. your practice schedule. It's the risk um, versus perceived consequence. And I don't think uh, a lot of people are willing to take the risk. And I think their perceived consequence is failure. Um, whereas for me, the only perceived consequence was I am going to learn something from this no matter what. Mm -hmm. The only consequence of this is positive. Even if it makes me no money, it ruins my daily life and my health, mm -hmm. which it did mm -hmm. a little bit for a while because it was so brutal and on the sleep thing. It was only going to be net positive at the end of the day. I think a lot of people worry about that. They worry about I don't want to be super negative, but I, I'm, I'm definitely opinionated when it comes to the current climate, just based on feedback that I get from people and the kinds of questions I get asked. It's not very, uh, what do you call it? Um, not very uh, hopeful in terms of people having the willpower to do the work, no matter what the lane is. You could be in finance or be an auto mechanic or a bass player. Yeah. A lot of people want instant gratification because their attention span is a, a microcosm of what it used to be 20 years ago. And this speaks to the, getting back to the album in 2004. What I want to say is like, yeah, it's great talking about YouTube and everything, but 2004 YouTube didn't exist. Social media didn't exist. MySpace didn't exist. I don't think it may have just come out, right? Yeah. MySpace. Friendster maybe. Friendster, probably. <laughs> yeah. Either way, I wasn't yeah. on any of it. So I was right. making an album in, at the very last nanosecond of the purely analog process. Mm. So there was but you, no... But you, were, but you were the first bass player, at least in my mind, that really understood and capitalized on the, the new online space. Like the I, very first. I, I wouldn't think of anybody else. I wouldn't disagree with that. that based, just based on on the history alone like i can say it this year i did this thing and i did this tour and made this album because of a b and c connected to the internet like and myspace was a huge thing like to me myspace gave us hope whereas facebook and anything that came after that is a total destructive force to art it may not be a destructive force to communication although that's debatable it may not be a destructive force to growing an audience also kind of debatable i think but to art you became a content creator instead of an artist. Now, I know everyone's goal is not to be an artist. I'm very aware of that. So I don't want to stay, say like, stand on my soapbox here and say, everyone must be an artist or everyone must think about this thing first. No, not at all. That was just important to me. And I noticed a massive shift mm. in the quality, even the quantity of art, of something that touches you and something you think about for days, weeks, months afterwards. We now have access to millions upon millions of things, visual stimulation, videos, art, uh, music, film. But to me, I don't notice a, an uptick in the amount of things that touch me and that stay with me than, than I did 20 years ago, before I had instant access to all this stuff, before I actually had to work 
to go to a record store and maybe go on the listening post at the end of the aisle in Tower Records and be, whoa, Herbie Hancock, Blue Note collection from the city, Imperial Isles. Damn, I don't know track three, the alternate take. Like that amount of work, rather than just being clack, 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 clack. Ah, fuck this. Clack, 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 clack. Fuck this. Like, you know. I think it's harder now. I think it's much harder now, actually. I, I think it's harder. I find all... it harder. It, so yeah, so if, if I just speak, like talk about like my own listening habits, sure. And Ian and I talked about this recently. Is that I think that for me, like the device really matters. If I do it, like so, for instance, if I'm on my phone and I'm kind of like it's all there and it's all accessible. I'll like flip through albums, tracks. I'll be listening to this, right. and then after that, I'll jump to another album. And I found that. And we've got like a, one of these Alexa things in the house. Yeah. You know, I can't mess with it. I'm like, hey, Alexa, play this album. And off it goes. Yep. And I yeah, actually yeah. really enjoyed that. And it made, we had, a, we had a conversation about it saying that I think that um, how I feel about it is that we're in the messy middle a little bit. And I think that it's, you know, and, and, yeah. and maybe not, but that's how I feel about it. Um, and I think that, how you listen to music if you if you're i guess conscious of it and deliberate about how you approach listening to music you can get back what we and what you were speaking about right here where you're like oh that when you listen to the album like four right. or five times over and that thing at the yeah. end of track four yeah. like we have all of we all had that you know but what, and what I, year were you guys born 78. 78 oh so we're all 78 were you born what? in 78, Yannick? 78. What's your birthday? November 19. Wow. Yeah, I'm yeah. October 29. There you okay. go, baby. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. I know I look like I was born in 68, but it was actually 78. <laughs> and But that's the thing, wow. right? Like, mm. we, we have that experience, but that, mm -hmm. that's great for us because we know. And even though we get caught up in the trap of scrolling and, uh, you know, we, we can still rely back on this muscle memory of how we grew up listening to albums, perhaps vinyl, cassette, into CD, long before the internet was even a thing. It's when you have to, like, let's go back to that album, for instance, 2004. It was at a time where I probably should have had a record deal because that would have saved me the 10 grand that it cost to make, you know, um, and it would have given me some promo. There might have been some booking agent in, in, interested and, and done some gigs and some revenue would have come back and there, it would have been more of a thing than it was. As it was, it was kind of, I don't want to say it was a vanity project because... I poured my heart and soul into it. And it was actually the fifth album I'd made, but the first one I'd released. I'd been making albums and throwing them in the trash for about four years before mm. that because um, I just wasn't happy. And it was finally the one that worked. Um, so, But it was right on the cusp. Like, and dude, it was a killer album. Come on. Well, thanks. I mean, I appreciate it. it was... <laughs> And, and we did it like it the, maybe awesome. the only way I could because I couldn't take a week in the studio, especially if we had a really nice studio as well in Manhattan Center Studios in New York. I did it all in one take. The whole album is live in one take and I filled the studio up. Like I was doing Snarky Puppy before half before, a decade yeah, yeah, before yeah, Snarky yeah, Puppy yeah, without yeah, the video yeah. cameras. Amazing. If I'd have known yeah. that I should have had someone with a fucking right. camcorder. Ah! Yes. It would have been way ahead of time. There were 80 people in the control room and the whole album is one take start to finish in that order with no yeah. overdubs, no repairs. I added some horns, like some uh, arrangement afterwards, but that was it. We rehearsed Wednesday, recorded Thursday, mixed Friday, mastered Sunday. I was the very last mastering session at the Hip Factory in New York before they closed. And on Monday, I got on a plane and went to Europe and a week later in the middle of my tour, the CD showed up. So mm. it was... 12 days start to finish production mm. about as analog as you can possibly get it was fun it was awesome i think the album stands up they were all my best friends it was an amazing experience at 25 years old or something to be doing that and to be in the studio with jojo and mark turner and like all these you know gretchen palato mm. and all these people that have since become like huge you know yeah, 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 turned yeah. into superstars um and I'm glad I did it then because it really showed me that I could do it and that it was okay to do it and fail. Because ultimately it was a massive failure. Musically very fulfilling. I and... wildly disagree. Wildly I mean, disagree. No, oh, I mean, I'm talking financially. financially. Like, oh, yeah, right, okay, okay. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I'm happy with the album, you know, like, yeah. 
the engineer from that album, the mix engineer is, I'm working with him on the last album and the next album coming up. It's like a crew of people that we've been together for almost 20 years now and years before that. No, in, emotionally, it was a great success. Yeah. But financially, it was a disaster. And at 25, you can't afford to have $10,000 disasters time over after and time over after time. Right. Yeah. You know, the reason Live at the 55 Bar got made was because the owner, which was the follow-up, uh, yeah, the follow-up album was because it was live. It was a gig, so there was money coming in for the gig, so the band got paid, and the owner was like, I want to do the album in my club, and it was a ster pair of stereo mics and a hard disk recorder, and that was fucking it. There was no budget. <laughs> he paid everyone 500 bucks to be on the record, and that was it. So that was a zero-cost album. Yeah. But then, fast forward 2010, space in between, another 10, 15 grand <laughs> financial disaster, you know. And I've, I, this is a video that's on my mind. I already talked about it in my Telegram channel a bit, but I'm, I, I'm going to share all of the numbers from the last 20 years of making records. And I'm, I think, minus 75 grand now. Yeah. I think that like... On making albums. The, the reason why I disagree, disagreed with you on the um, on Mystery to Me being, a, I think that that was, the, that was really, really important. From my from my vantage point, right? You take it for what it's worth. But it was really <laughs> important because it was freaking awesome. And it was the marketing and the brand building for everything that came after that, right? Mm. You did something. That album stood out in such a way that nobody else had done at that time. Well, it was and the importance so, of, a, of a calling card, essentially, right? Yeah, it was exactly. the importance of saying, hey, yeah. this is me. This is what I believe in. You like it, you don't like it, but this is it. And, and this is what I'm basing my career on. And this is how I'm going on the road. This is what I'm showing to promoters and club owners. And this is how I present myself. You know, looking back, I could have done, you know, a million more things with it and done print media and more interviews and maybe played a few more gigs. But yeah, that was definitely the starting point of, like you said, branding. Right. I, I, I use that word really. Somebody freaking kicked my ass in the in the, in the comments of some video recently because I I used the word branding. Obviously, yeah. I, I'm like I'll stand by what I mean. Like I know that I'm right. I know I'm using the term. I know what correct. you mean. Yeah. I'm using the well. I'm using the term correctly, but I think that people have a, a negative connotation with it. But I still sure. can't. I can't. There's no other word for it, right? Or whatever. You know, building. I don't know, but let's just go with branding because that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's when someone says the name of the artist or the company, it's how it makes the receiver feel. Feel, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. That's branding. Yeah, yes. exactly. And how crazy, it, how crazy as is has the change become for that and for facilitating that over the past ten, five, five, ten years, right? Like yeah. the amount of access you have to people and the amount you can make them feel and how careful you have to be with that. You know, yeah, and 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 not to get involved in the fucking YouTube comments and the trolls, mm. and the the feedback that you get from people who are just spending their time wisely, and <laughs> they have all the facts, and they've been there with you, and they they it's like you you hear from some people, it's like they were your manager for a decade or something. You know, the amount of information they claim to have. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. There's also a really interesting thing. Remember when we were kids, and there was this thing around like selling out, like branding corporate sure. those words were so taboo you wouldn't yeah. talk about your your band like a brand because it was not cool and i feel like with the advent of tiktok when people are getting brand deals it's almost celebrated in a way like you know and i'm i'm feeding into your feelings about social media yannick and and i have i have actually very opposite feelings but i i see the point and i see what you how you feel about it like people are celebrating brand deals almost like art or 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 more so than art they're like oh you got that brand deal congratulations instead of right. oh you made that record congratulations but that speaks to my point of attention yes being an an influence like this yes. influencer slash influence thing being way more celebrated than art and sure. I, I have I, the thing is i have no problem if the thing is if you a want brand. to be like let's yeah. let's talk about the taboo version of the brand like scott was saying like the people the thing that people gave you a hard time about let's talk about that version of the brand i've got no problem if it's toshiba or kia or, or or ford or something celebrate those numbers like get your fucking bottom line way up there be a business and be successful and be celebrated sure. for that but don't call it art mm, leave mm -hmm. that to aston martin leave that to bugatti oh leave that to people who make art at a complete loss, Bugatti's a great example. The car costs $3.7 million to buy. It cost them $5 million to make. Mm. 
it's a, it's a loss leader to sell more VW Golfs. But that's <laughs> the art, okay? And that's mm. the, that. I think that should be celebrated. The, uh, for us, the music should be celebrated as art and not to get confused. And I think it gets very, very confused. Yes, yes. Um, which is unfortunate. And that's my, that's my reason for like just ditching the noise of social media because I want to be able to like hang my hat and say, I didn't get distracted. Sure. Well, you know, and, I, and I would love to, I, I would actually like to put a pin in that too, because I'd love to sure. talk to you about that and hear, and hear you I got talk all day, about man. this. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just want to say, I have wanted to say to you for so long uh -oh. that, no, <laughs> not uh-oh, <laughs> that I was inspired so much by your content creation. So it's interesting, my career and my lane and the music that I make is very, very different. And so I was never interested in jazz vocabulary. Well, sorry to interrupt you. What's yeah. your thing? Um, I play what rock music. You? I play okay, rock okay. music. I love pop music. I love playing Great. EDM music, hip hop music. I play, I live in Minneapolis. I do a bunch of different projects. I play with singer songwriters, Guild Flatwounds, Pick. I play with a hip hop artist making synth sounds. It's a really wide sort of variety of things. And when I saw your content, Yannick, and Scott, your content, I was not yet making content. And I was inspired by seeing someone else do the process. I feel like, like Yannick, when I hear you talk about content being the means to an end, the end is the art, the end is the show, the end is mm -hmm. the tour. I understand that. And it was really actually helpful for me to hear that because I was like, yes, of course, that's how you feel about it. Because you're an artist, you're striving to make records. But I was so inspired by you putting yourself out there in the daily vlog. Um, and I was one of the people that watched all of that. And and I wasn't Sorry. even thinking, <laughs> no, it, please don't apologize. Way too it much wasn't... tennis in those vlogs. <laughs> Dude, but it was, it was inspiring to me to say like, wow, like I didn't want to be I didn't want to sound like you. I didn't want my career to go in that direction. Do you know what I mean? But I, I don't mean yeah. that in any kind of derogatory no, I, I way, know. you know? I, yeah. I, 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 like, I, I, I was like, oh, <laughs> someone is doing their thing. And the spirit and tenacity at which you pursued your thing was the inspiration for me. And I imagine there are a lot of other people, not even necessarily bass players, that feel the same way. So when you talk about it being this failure, when you talk about it, you know, when you do this with, I say, and I know it's lighthearted, but I was someone in the context of that that was paying very, very, very close attention. And it was super inspiring to me. So I just, appreciate. It. I wanted to say thank you for that. It's, it's good to hear one, you say, one, good, one positive feedback. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh yeah, no, come I, on, dude. But, but it's, um, no, I'm not, I'm, 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 and I'm certainly not that self-deprecating person at all. I fucking hate that shit. Uh, and it's, it's a kind of a, 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 an unhealthy downward spiral when we get into that. Of course, I, I don't think we can escape the self-deprecating things sometimes, right? Um, just basic human condition, emotion, especially <laughs> as musician and neurotic artist or whatever you want to call it. But um, yeah, I mean, I've always had one thing at the foundation, which is uh, the, the only thing you need to succeed at anything is the willpower to get up and do it again the next day, mm. regardless of the outcome. And I think the reason I am so uh, against social media, again, it's a personal thing, like that. this is what works for me. I know people are super successful at it and are also happy at it. Right. Not everyone is as happy as they're trying to make out. Of course. There's a lot of bullshit involved, of which, course. Is, which is one of the scary elements to me. That's yes. one of the things I'm like, oh, I yeah. don't want a part of that. Right. Um, but it's like a, a lot of people d don't have the willpower to get up and do it again without it affecting them, like the, the failure. Like mm. I talk about failure, but when I say the vlog was a failure, I mean that in actually quite a positive sense. Mm. Like I literally... Uh, if I picked up the bass right now, I actually held it before the microphone issue thing. I don't think, think I've even played any notes before we came on. But the first thing I'm looking for is a failure. Mm. The first thing I'm looking for is a mistake when I pick up the bass every single time. Because if I pick up and play something that I know already, then I'm not learning anything. That's great. You know? Yep. Mm. It's, why do I want to regurgitate the thing I already did? It's so easy to do that. It's so easy to make the Instagram reel just like you did last week that got 200,000 views mm -hmm. or the, the TikTok or this thing or you have a formula, you know, which is what makes it very interesting for me. And maybe this is boring to people listening. Or I, don't, I don't know. But what makes it very interesting rebooting the YouTube channel is like, how do I do that and do something different each time? Because hmm. I don't want to get in a framework of like Mr. Beast, uh, who I think is 
on, on kind of a genius level uh, on the surface, but really the, the 11 years he spent researching how to do it was the real thing that I yes. don't think, you don't see you on the main channel. If you dig deep into the interviews, yeah. Yeah. you see oh, it. Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. Being on man. conference calls for 15 hours a day talking about the brightness of a thumbnail yes. and the title and this, that, exactly. and the other. I think that's kind of genius. And why not leverage that if you can support it with something honest that you feel uh, uh, really, really good about making. Um, and it, what's really interesting about me rebooting the YouTube channel is like, how do I do that different every time? And not like sell out, as you said, not fall in the rut, not be a part of the machine and still have it worth my time. Yes. I went to bed at 1.15 this morning because I was making a four minute, 30 second video in one day. Right. And that involved 52 cutaway shots, yes. plus the script, plus the thumbnail, plus the title, plus the rendering, plus the sound design, plus the, the soundtrack, you know, See, which I love. Yeah, I know. You know I love dude, doing it, this but I have is a kid thing. and a life. You know? <laughs> dude, but it, it, what's so interesting to me, Yannick, is you talk about this thing of like, you want to be a musician, you want to be an artist. It's all in service of, you say that, but mm -hmm. then... I hear you talk about watching interviews with Jimmy where he's talking about the brightness of a thumbnail. And mm -hmm. when I watch your content, like when you were doing the pedal show, that intro, mind blowing, <laughs> dude. Like for real, <laughs> let's start the show. That best whole thing. Best dude, thing I ever did with my wife. She was so huge uh, with that. And dude, like, she's a great designer as well as being a great bass player and everything. She's really, she does all my books and she's an amazing designer. So we did yeah. that stop motion thing together. Oh, had a blast. So cool. That was like a pandemic couple, like date night doing uh, <laughs> dude, stop motion. Shout out Chelsea, man. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. Well, I, so what I'm seeing is I'm seeing that you love both. I, at least from my yeah. vantage point, dude, I see that when you're making content, you actually really do like content. And that in, in a way... I, but I don't think of it as content. That's the thing. You're thinking of it as art. I, I'm, I, it's like YouTube is filmmaking. The recording studio yeah. is music. Yes. Uh, and that's it. I'm yes. not like the, the string video. Like what a... <laughs> In the grand scheme of things, kind of a dumb. Well, how do you find the best strings, man? You know, what well, kind of a, 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 a dumb video. thing. I want to watch it. When I have this archive of like a petabyte of live footage that, from twenty-five years of my career that I can cut into that, I get to weave in yeah. reality. I get yes. to make it not sound like an ad for DR strings or something. And yes. I get to weave in reality and say, hey, connected to this thing that is actually quite important, knowing what strings to use, how to use them, how often do you change them, all those things. Weaving into that is the reality of being a musician. Yes. Regardless of your style, your age, you're an amateur, you're a professional, semi-pro, you play in a pub band, you play on arena stages, doesn't matter. Let's bring those two things closer together. So Absolutely. there is the content element, but the art thing, and the, I want the art thing to like kind of push the content out of the frame. So that's the overwhelming sense, emotional sense that the, the viewer is left with. Like, oh, that's reality. And maybe I want to be a part of that thing. I want to go to a show. Like, I want to go see what this stuff's, I don't care about how it sounds on YouTube. I want to go be in the room and hear how that thing sounds yeah. live, you know? So you are checking out Jimmy talking about the brightness of thumbnails in service of making art in service of so that someone can come see you at the live show. A hundred percent. I check out as much Jimmy, uh, uh, Mr. Beast, Jimmy, whatever, as I do Van Neistat or yeah. Colin and Samir or any of these people who dig deep yes. into the nuts and bolts of it. Like Colin and Van, Samir a little Van's, more like... Van Neistat's just... Van Neistat is amazing. He's incredible. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. His videos and, are and fantastic, right, aren't they? rightly crowned the most creative Neistat brother, I think. Yes, you know? right. absolutely. Case, yeah. Casey's ridiculous, but Van has like this super cool style, lives up here in Topanga Canyon and just kind of a hippie dude. And, you know, what is it? The most interesting, what is his thing? The most interesting, no, not interesting. He has did this he mantra. Work, yeah, there's a mantra. Yeah, I, <laughs> I can't remember it, but yes. There is a mantra. Anyway, so that I, I like that. You know, mm. I, I think between Mr. Beast and Van Neistat, though, that's actually, those are two great things. The well, genius of yes. the marketing and the, the concept and the process of Mr. Beast, along with the uh, unrelenting honesty of someone like Van Neistat. I would love to find a balance between those yes. two to where oh, I could God. grow, grow yeah. the audience. You right. know? 
I wish because it, it's it, so. Yeah. I've just been listening to Go you guys it. talk. What's Sorry, yeah. I've been thinking Sorry. about <laughs> just no, just like based off. It's, I'm not. I'm not waiting to sort of like you know jump in. Like based off what you've been both talking about, is that like it's all art really? And I think there's nuance between it. Like yeah, like what Van Nyerstadt did does, or what Casey Nyerstadt did, or um, what Mr. Beast did or does. Like mm-hmm. all could be defined as art in a certain sure. way because it's all filmmaking, right? But the, the the strange little nuance here is that the 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 content or video content that you're creating, Yannick, is a conduit to something else. It's to build that following. So I think that sure. different and I would argue and there's maybe a, a balance of that for so for Van, for instance, I would argue that what he's creating is the art for himself. That is his, his artistic output, and he will monetize that in different ways off the back of it, right? Sure. Sort of like selling mugs or T-shirts or whatever it is, where for you, you're trying to create the content, you know, get an audience together. You're not monetizing that actual art or content. You're moving an audience to somewhere else, whether it be a live show or something else. And you're creating extra art, more art over here. Double so there's art. All double, double art. <laughs> there's two, that's what I was thinking when I was listening to you, you talking. I was like, actually, there's one type of art over here because we've defined that it, it is art. And then there's actually, for you, your main gig. and it, it, The art and, that you feel and, and here. Yeah, the, the sort of like yeah the, the the piece that you'd sort of like keel over and die without that piece over here but it's still both art and then also what i was thinking about in that conversation as well is that i think that art can be p- produced on any platform and i think that there I is a i think that there is a and I do worry about social media. I worry about social media because I've got two young kids and they haven't got mobile phones and all of that. I do yeah. worry about that. And I know that um, I don't feel very positive about that, the usage of social media. But I think that that is very different from the creation of art or content, or whatever, on social media. I think that it should be, there should be a distinction between the two, between consumption on social media and actual creation on social media because they're just platforms at the end of the day, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, these are all platforms for me at least. So, and the content changes on, on different platforms, but I think that they're, they can all be used as to do exactly what we're talking about here, to create art, to inspire people and to move them specifically for people like us to somewhere else, you know, that we want to, I, I don't. I don't else, disagree. Yeah. I don't disagree with that. And one point before I get crucified, because I've already been crucified for it before, where you were saying like you, you're not going to monetize the YouTube thing. Fuck yeah, I'm going to monetize the YouTube thing, and I'm going to take that AdSense <laughs> check every week. If it's 250 bucks or 250 thousand dollars, don't get me wrong. Like I don't want to be like, oh yes, I don't monetize my channel. I'm yeah, just yeah. doing it for the lo-. no. Fuck that. I'll take the money, and what I'll do with the money is exactly what Mr. Beast does, and invest it straight back into the channel. Buy a second yeah, yeah, camera, yeah. whatever it is. You know, I'm not trying to. Like I said in a previous podcast episode last week I, I, i'm not buying diapers with my youtube adsense money sure. life is fine everything else takes care of it the federis did it, it. Woo. <laughs> i'm good for 30 <laughs> years after that no um and yeah i don't disagree that those other platforms you can make art on them and touch people and and make make, make something super wholesome my only my only concern artistically speaking personal uh, uh objectives aside is that it is way less friendly to long form uh long form content long form art of course and the attention yeah. span is expected to be under three seconds if that these days i've been reading like scientific studies that say it's a second and a half if you don't capture them you're they're gone and because of that what people do on those platforms is cater to that sure with youtube yeah, there's sure. there's all of that on yeah. youtube as well but it's i think it's a little stretched it's not ideal but it, i think it is a little better I'm not trying to say it's better and that's the only place to be, but that that is my biggest concern with the way art is going on those like micro blogging platforms like Instagram and TikTok. There's user no intents, user intents differently, right? So like user, in yeah, YouTube, sure. like you're going to get to go there to watch long form content. Sure, they're doing shorts and stuff like that, but I right. think that yeah, but but on 
as well as that, they're actually leaning much more into long form content on YouTube. And absolutely, ideally, they'll start prioritizing that within the algorithm as well. Obviously, you've got guys like Joe Rogan, Lex Friedman, who have got long form podcasts. Well, Joe Rogan, yeah. not so much anymore. But, you know, back in the day, they had long form podcasts. And I've heard that yeah, on YouTube, YouTube right? yeah, YouTube mm -hmm. will be prioritizing that as well. So hopefully there'll be a balance there. But I get your point. I get your point. I think that I just really try and have that distinction for me is the the consumption like it yeah it worries me that you know it's going to be two or three seconds or whatever it is right as a consumer that worries me but but not as, as an artist not as somebody who it would be it would, would worry me in terms of like how do how do i create this piece of art something that will you know catch people's attention and, and feel meaningful and feel meaning yeah. in, in three right. to five seconds that's a challenge hey, and maybe the artists out there like that's their thing Maybe yeah. they can do that, and it's like totally geared towards them. I just know for me and for the sake of the album, for instance, I mean, let's circle back to that because you said we talked briefly about albums, like music being free, right? And I think there's a, there's a whole lane there about the sort of death of the album, perhaps the revival of the album with vinyl more recently. I think we're in the messy middle with it. Just to, just yeah. to say what I said before, I think yeah. that right now, incredibly hard to monetize for mm -hmm. many people. Right. Is it going to be like that in the future? I don't know. Hopefully not. Hopefully there's going to be new ways of monetizing. So last year when I did One Way Out, as my last record, um, I, I did a pre-sale. I want to make the distinction between a pre-sale and a crowdfunding thing. It was not crowdfunding. I will never, ever, ever crowdfund anything. You guys can hold my feet to the fire on that one 20 years from now if you're watching this and I'm trying to use Indiegogo or some shit, but I'm pretty certain I'll never crowdfund anything. Have, have, what's the What's the... I guess what's the distinction between the two? So, Honestly, I'm not sure. No, no. So I, I, hey, let me explain. So the the um, the pre-sale was, hey guys, do you want to be involved in this? Um, there are I set five different levels of involvement um, and you know increasing levels of uh, reward for the amount of money you were willing to spend up front for a pre-sale mm -hmm. of the album. But there was no monetary goal in order for the project to get greenlit. So if I did three albums as a pre-sale and made $60, I was still going to Spain, I was still making the album, and I was still gonna go $15,000 in the hole. Okay, got That it. was yeah. it. So with crowdfunding, you say, oh, here's my goal, I wanna raise $15,000 to make this album, and once we raise the $15,000, then we go do the thing. Before I even launched the pre-sale, I'd already told everyone what the release date of the album was. So there was Got it. Like okay. no turning back. It was set in stone. I'd booked the studio in Spain. I booked flights. My engineer came from Argentina. The band came from all over the world. I had a camera crew hired, the whole thing. And this was the first time I ever broke out uh, even on a record. I did just enough pre-sales to have made all the money back from making the album the, the, literally the day before it came out. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. It's kind of the Kevin Ke the, the thousand true fans thing. Can you convince enough people to part? Can you convince a thousand people to part with a hundred dollars a year and split that hundred dollars up into a concert ticket, an album, a T-shirt, a mug, maybe a lesson, uh, a book, or something? Mm -hmm. And, and there's, so, there's your so, there's your hundred thousand dollars gross income yeah. from so a thousand if, people. If you would put that on Spotify, uh -huh. would that not have been the case? Mm. I've I've posted before and I am going to make an in-depth video Wait, about this. Could you posted... have done that? Could you have no, could you have done it? You couldn't have. People one of the one of like... the one of the things was the exclusive exclusivity of it yeah. and I guaranteed that this album would not be released to the public for at least 6 months and it ended up being 9 months or almost a year that I put it on Spotify and Spotify is just an archive for me now. It's a public so facing business card. So you card. did put That's it on it. Spotify. Yeah, almost a year after the album was out. But that was the exclus exclusivity was gone. They got the album up front, like as soon as it was out, they had to, it was amazing because people had to custody their own music again. Like people had never done that before. People, there were people buying the album that had never even bought from iTunes and downloaded the MP3. They had no idea how to do it. So that was a barrier, <laughs> right. you know? Sure. Because people yeah. were just like, where do I put this? It doesn't show up in my Spotify. <laughs> right. You know, I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, how old are you? Oh, I'm 17. Oh, for fuck's sake, you know? <laughs> Take your VR goggles off and get a hard drive. And, you know, like, Incredible. So, so there was that. So that's something I'm leaning into a little more now. I don't think on the next one I'm going to do the five levels. I think I'm going to go for a bigger number of pre-sales, but a fixed maybe twenty dollar price what were, point. Yeah. What were the just sort of like explain to everybody what the I guess the strategy behind why you'd want different levels as well. 
Yeah, so people with with means and who are fans of the music of the art, they they want the opportunity to get involved on a on a bigger level than just having the album for twenty bucks. Um, and I gave bonuses, like I made a po a poster, so everyone in the presale got their name on this huge poster, an album poster with their name on it really huge file size so they could print it and hang it in their place um the very top level i did two of these where i did an exclusive song that would never be released to the public like a wu-tang clan wu-tang clan did this with their album where it was one of one right yeah. and they destroyed the masters so i did that for two people and uh, did did a song each for them it never saw the light of day i don't even have them anymore mm. and those two people are you know so for that it was like 750 dollars a pop so that was like yeah, a, yeah. 10 percent of the of the tour of the album budget was in two sales wow mm. you know and then yeah. i think there was like oh i did a uh a, a a small live stream like Q&A and I got the whole band and the engineer so I did that for 10 people and I think it was maybe 250 bucks and you got executive producer credit on the documentary mm. I made a documentary had a film crew come down so that was another level so it was like five different levels and where of did that go that is now that was exclusive as well again like everything was exclusive for almost the first year now that's on YouTube you can go watch it on my channel it's a 55 minute documentary that um i had so, two I had so a, a key part of that strategy was like holding it like basically exclusivity but that exclusivity yeah. had a time on it yeah there was an end date where hey it, it, you yeah, get this and it, yeah and it wasn't specific either and i polled the audience because i was like because I, I got a booking agent for the first time for my own music i'd always booked my own tours myself forever i've have done that for almost 30 years now um 12 or 25 years whatever um and i got a booking agent and they were coming across like hey where's your latest album like, why can't we hear your latest music? Why can't we tell promoters and club owners, like, where to go hear you? And I was like, oh, that's going to be a barrier to entry in terms of my public-facing music and art. So I polled the people that had done the pre-sale. I said, hey, would you guys be pissed off if I put this out? Because I, I wanted to leave it two years. I wanted to make it super exclusive for two years and not put it out anywhere. And everyone was like, no, go for it. We actually kind of would like to have it more available than the MP3 we have sitting on a hard drive that fell in the bath two weeks ago you know what i mean yeah. so they weren't they weren't pissed off about it and i ended up doing that and i was very open with the audience and said hey i'm thinking of doing this what do you think mm. and it was overwhelmingly do it and if it means we can come see you live easier then awesome you know um and that's how i'm gonna go i'm, I'm planning to go down to argentina in the first week of august take the band my drummer is in paris tom uh, corley is in london my engineer is in buenos aires i'm gonna do in about a month's time we'll start a pre-sale for that and uh and you're gonna see how it's the same goes. structure same structure except this time there are going to be live shows involved in it as well so i'm going to do probably three or four live shows in chile argentina and uh uruguay and then go into the studio for four days this time so it's a bigger production cool for sure um, that's exciting yeah, yeah man, you know great, and yeah. wayne krantz randomly lives in buenos aires so i might call wayne and say hey you oh, want to play a track on a record you know so they're kind of cool things potentially that could happen with it that's a little different um yeah yeah, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to it. I would love Go to ahead. ask you, Yannick, about, I would love, we've been talking a lot about like social, uh, you know, we album We haven't talked about strategy. music really once. <laughs> <laughs> I would yeah, love. Oh, we do give a, yeah, like we do give a shit about it. If anybody's listening thinking why, why are these guys like narrowing on about this? But it is really interesting because it's brutally hard. You know, it's hard to actually yes. uh, do this thing week in, week out. And then, and we love it. You know, I love it. I know that you guys really love it yeah. and it's inspiring to do this, but it's just, you don't generally hang out with the many, many people that do it. I'm imagining That's that so sort of true. like your friends. It's yeah, very so when, insular. Yeah, yeah, when you get yes. together in a group of uh, group of mates like this, you're like, oh, like-, like Finally, how you, somebody who understands. I know, yeah, it's really like, wild. What are you thinking about this? Like, mm. how are you thinking about growth? What are you doing on this yeah. platform? How are you talking to your, you know, like how are you doing, like releasing your albums? How are right. you putting your bonus structures together for your yeah. album? All of that stuff I think is wildly interesting. Anyway, Ian. Oh, well, go, take I, your question. I have just been so- intrigued by the combination of in your artistry when you have been okay you're working on chops you're working on phrasing you're working on chops may not be the right word but you're transcribing <laughs> you're working on phrasing you're playing the same thing without varying it for three minutes in a row it is all about hands connection instrument action just right for you used to be low higher all this <laughs> yeah. but then also you have this thing around sounds and not just sounds that you make with your body and your hands and your instrument, but all these external electronic sounds. And I would love to know 
before Baby Elephant, before JoJo OC2. There's just the pedals. <laughs> yeah, there's the pedals. Gosh, look at that. Look at that. They're so nicely lit, too. Kudos, man. Yeah, That's I'm working lovely. on it. <laughs> where, <laughs> where did Fucking the, hell. where did it start for you sonically? Was it a record? Was it a pedal you bought? Where was the fascination of sound? Where did it come from? What was the impetus? I mean, I'm from South London, innit, mate? You know what I mean? Jungle and Ting. <laughs> Yeah. Pirate radio, uh, you know, in my car, in my old Ford Sierra estate, A Reg Ford Sierra estate, brown. <laughs> <laughs> Until some knucklehead hit me in the Thank passenger you. door. Thank you for that brown, by the way. Brown. <laughs> brown. Oh, it was, it was, it was all yeah. kind of, it was yeah. turd brown and uh, <laughs> night after a curry, you know. Yeah. And, until some knucklehead hit me in the passenger door and then it was brown with one orange door because I couldn't afford to get it painted. <laughs> That's sick, yes. Yeah, and the old, like, you know, pull the pull this car stereo out and take it with you because yeah. someone had smashed your car window oh, yeah, and, and, yeah, and, yeah. and and fuck you over. So, yeah, I mean, I'm from England, electronic music, uh, although I know it didn't originate there. Like, pirate radio when I was a kid in South London was huge. Yeah. And even if it was, like, more come out like Prodigy and, and people like that, um, I was way into it. So that actually sort of predated all of the jazz stuff, yes. I would say. Um, and I, 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 not that I knew anything about it. I didn't know that you combine an OC2 with a fuzz to get a saw wave to make a synth bass sound or didn't right. know what filters were or oscillators or you know FM synthesis, none of that shit. Didn't right. get into that until way later. If you go back, please don't do this. I don't recommend <laughs> this to anyone. But if you go back and look at like early instances of me on the internet, my favorite phrase was, I'm not the gear guy. Right, sure. I'm not the, what a fucking dumb thing to say. I mean, <laughs> at, at the time, I had like three or four pedals. I really kind of wasn't the gear guy. I couldn't give a shit. Very much a purist living in New York, playing lots of like jazz gigs as much as they can be jazz as, as an electric bass player. Um, but with JoJo kind of, I would say around 2000, 2001, when I first, I did a couple of different stints in his band Nerve. Yes. Actually, this band right there, that yeah, would be the course. stint from 07. Yeah. Um, like I said in my last pedal video, actually, uh, if anyone wants to check it out, I talk about that quite a bit, about being on the road with him and about like not having the money for a uh, Mooga Fuga um, MF-101, well, like the low-pass filter, and he mm -hmm. fronted me the money for that and took it out of my first paycheck. That's great. You know, I, so yeah, I, I, I rapidly got into it with him, with him at the helm, with him in the driving seat telling me like, oh, yeah, we should do this and this is a signal chain. And I couldn't believe of all the millions of videos I had, I couldn't believe I couldn't find the video of him on my living room floor in New York with this shitty old SKB pedal board, like putting the pedals in order and talking to the camera. I really want to find this video because oh. I know I have it somewhere. Oh, and that's him explaining do. Signal Chain to me. He's like, Fun. yeah, well, you know, when Tim LeFave was in the band and Yossi <laughs> Fine and like named all these bass players that had come before me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And this is what we were doing. I was showing him the setting on OC2 and no number two, but all number one and blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay, dude, can you just set it up and we'll go and play? And, uh, you know, so I spent, you know, a lot of hours in a basement with him working mm. on those kind of things. So from an ele electronic standpoint and yeah. recreating electronic sounds kind of acoustically speaking, um, that, that was where that came from. And then, uh, I mean, I just showed you the shot down the wall. That's one side. There's another side here. There's a storage with another 150 pedals in it. I, I have like at least five packages coming this week of pedals from people. It's uh, now I'm the pedal guy. Like, yes, for real, for real. <laughs> well, and there's there's like a, a there's obviously an art thrust to it for sure because you're using them to make music, but you also, to me, it seems like you have this intrinsic, like of the pedal of like you seem a bit like a collector in a sense too. All oh. the OC twos, all the. Yeah, yeah. Did you have like? Oh, is there a collector that was, that was, in your world? A hundred percent. And that was another pre fatherhood thing that I, I sold a bunch of OC twos. I had twenty one of them. Oh. Holy shit! And I, th I think I'm down to about five or six now. I kept the best ones, the original ones from '82 with the yeah, R on the, the end R, and all course. that. Yeah. So the 12 volt jobbies and yeah. Uh, yeah so I, I dished a few OC2s. I actually got rid of my MF 101, the low pass filter. I, I'm, I have totally been a collector, but since my daughter was born, I'm definitely going more into the minimalist thing and mm. like the shelves. Instead of being like six deep. And then in the back, just stacked up all the way. 
Now it's just a, a, a row of pedals on the front, and they're going to look good in the back of a shot. <laughs> and I'm slowly doing this yeah, track yeah, lighting, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. I legitimately use, I would say, 65% of them. You know, some of them are for show because they're just like, I mean, look. Cool looking. Oh, well, please, they're, do they're, it. I mean, yeah, do it, Yannick, do it. Do it. <laughs> yes, dude. Uh, it's fantastic. It's busting out the pedals. Oh, he's grabbing a, more than one, more than two, more than three. Just going to play by play it. We got some big boxes coming in. Ooh, oh, baby. Hang on. I'll be back with you. <laughs> Look at this stuff coming in. <laughs> but, you know, that chair looks really cool. One thing about being a collector is collect that when it. one soft tech big muff falls on the floor, you've always got a backup. Yeah, lovely. That's a classic. Those are classics. Oh, Look nice. at those. Get, some, get yeah. some light on these bad boys. Ah, there's yeah. the light. Look there at that. There you go. There you go. Uh, so, yeah, but who's taking this on the road? Right. Like, who in their right mind is taking a soft tech big muff? This one, oh, this one does have the, the battery hookup. Yep. yep. Modded. Nobody's taking that. No. Who who wants a, this is so dusty. Um uh, who wants a uh Akai head rush looper? Right. Get my tone brush out here. Yeah, boy. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. And then like, you know, C V controller. Look at this thing. Yeah. It yes. weighs more than my kid. Right. You know, like <laughs> yeah. nobody's taking that. Right. This one has a wooden box. I mean, for Christ's <laughs> sake. So yeah, in that sense, I'm a little bit of a collector. I love those pieces. I got in really early before the market exploded and before big muffs were like five, six hundred dollars. You know, I'm really good friends with uh, Juan Alderete, pedalsandeffects.com. I'm sure you guys yeah. are well aware. And I actually was the one who suggested he start pedalsandeffects.com like whenever it no was way. 10 years ago. Amazing. So, yeah, yeah. Amazing. I had the podcast. I interviewed him for my podcast yeah. back in the day. And he, he was like, yeah, I love it. I was like, dude, buy the domain name, start a show, you know? Oh, and incredible. The rest is history. And so, yeah, he convinced me to get a couple of those. I was at his studio. He has a thousand pedals. I was trying them. I was like, oh, let me get into this. So you, uh, have, this, you have this thing with, with pedals, but it mm -hmm. seems to me like you've never had the same thing with basses. Why? No, it makes me puke thinking about it. Why? Because I've always played, I've always played like one bass a lot. You know, I've always had like, I had the, the Federa, e even though the first one and the signature one were similar, you know what I mean? I yeah. kind of consider it to be exactly the same lane, fulfilling yeah. exactly the same function, basically the same sound. Um, then with all the studio stuff I did, which was kind of a, especially like 10 years in New York and a little bit in LA, it was just, I had all the utility bases. Like, I, camera angle's not wide enough, but I've got like a Goya, maybe I can. Oh yeah, come on now. Sacrifice that angle. Fuck. Here we go. Uh, yep. Yeah, so sure. Goyer yeah, yeah, in yeah. here, a P bass, Mattison with a oh, with a triple P. I don't know if you've seen oh, that yeah, before. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Three P bass pickups. Um, what else is back there? Fender Music Master. I remember then, the Music Master arc so well. I mean, I remember in the in the uh when you were making content around that bass and how you went and it was the dark horse on the wall at the studio and then you tried to buy it and couldn't buy it and then found another one. I mean, I remember that arc very yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I found one within 200 serial numbers of the one. Uh, it was um, uh, Jim O'Rourke from Sonic Youth. Amazing. It was yeah, his bass yeah. and he had left it at Sear Sound. I was doing this record with Bob Reynolds and John Mayer and that was the, that was the bass I ended up playing on every single track but one. Cause that, but that's the other thing. That's that's how little I care. I go to the studio with like I went with four bases, and I was living in LA by then. So I flew to New York with four bases and all my gear. And the first thing I did was like ditched all my bases in the corner. Say, hey guys, you have some piece of shit in the corner that you haven't used for a decade. Like, oh yeah, I think we have something old. Well, you so I was say like, great, but you say you don't care. But but wasn't it? I would hazard a guess that it was more of like the vibe. You get in that room, Mayor. You're thinking about Pino. You're thinking about that, and you're going. Mm, I wonder if there might be an instrument with older strings, with something that might fit this thing better. Yeah, but I already had a P bass with me that had ten year old tape wound flats on it. Mm. So I had that. I knew that going in. I had that covered. I had the Goya at the time. So I had all. I had short scale. I had regular scale. I had old yes. strings. Mm. Yes. I just, you know, I, I like surprises. Mm. I did this this solo tour like six years ago that was actually in the daily vlog a lot, the last minute world tour where I was just on my own. And I did this thing for a few weeks in Europe where I said, "Hey, bring someone, bring a pedal to a show, any pedal." 
and I'll plug it in my chain and see if I can do something with it. God, That's the pieces cool. of shit people bought out were amazing. <laughs> Hot, the most horrendous <laughs> stuff you would just walk by in a store got the best results out of it oh, sounds yeah. i never thought yeah. i would make you know so well and that's that testament to like improv right and and being sure. being confident enough that a surprise isn't going to of course sink the ship you're right. going to do great with it because you know your mm -hmm. instrument well you're going to play to the pedal yeah i've just yeah. i've just wondered that all like why you didn't get excited about Rickenbackers, why you didn't get excited about Hofner, why didn't, like, there's all these pedals and these flavors. And I just I mean, I am I excited about bases. those basses when I show up in the studio and they're there. Right. You know, when I go to the bunker, I know John has a bunch of stuff that I like, you know, where certain studios in LA have them, certain studios in Europe have them. Yeah. I have a friend in Germany who has uh, a Nile, one of Nile Rogers' old P basses from way back in the day. And I know when I go in that studio, I'm going to play it. Um, I like Guild Starfires. I like short scale basses. I played a uh, Gibson Ripper and a Gibson Grabber on a jazz record that I never thought I would in New York. Um, yeah, I, I do like it when it comes up, but I like to be surprised. Mm. Um, I think because I focus so much on my own music and I'm not, I'm not Nathan East, I'm not Lee Sklar, I'm not just running to the studio every day. I've had no aspirations to be someone else's bass player for my career. That's just how I did it. You know, I know it suits Nate and Lee and, and, and Marcus and all those guys. And Marcus is probably a, a good example of somebody who did both right. hyper successfully. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and not like Stanley, who kind of played on some other people's records and has a ma massive solo career, but Marcus like played on real records, like yeah. as a side man, like no yeah, fucking around, much. like in the yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that exactly. all you need to say? Yeah, yeah. never too yeah. much, and then tales, like you listen to <laughs> yeah. album tales. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Forget it, that's it. It's Killing. over. It's like st success story, tie a bow in it, <laughs> done. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I've never aspired to do that. Not that it's mm. not fun, and, and not that I don't love being in the studio because that is one of my favorite places to be. Um, but I did that a lot already. I did that in New York for a decade, every day going to the studio and doing stuff and producing and writing as well. Mm. I think I was always interested in it because I also got to produce and write. Just like when I was a sideman touring with pop artists, I was almost always the musical director as well. So I had that little bit of maybe interaction with the artist, a little bit of musical input. I wasn't just, just there doing a job, you know? We should all be mm. thankful that we have jobs, I guess, at the time. But I think that was the, the way I got through it, the way I managed to get up out of bed in in the morning and go go do the gig mm -hmm. it was because i was able to c uh, contribute and of course learn as a result you know all of that feeds back every pop gear i ever did feeds right back into the pedal board and the way i create sounds and maybe i'm listening to john hassel and schooly sferison and all of these like ethereal ambient kind of people mm. but half the pop gigs i did created the foundation for what goes underneath that and makes makes me able to like punch someone in the heart when I go play a gig, mm -hmm. you know? It was nice yes. making the string video yesterday where I said, well, I like these strings because I have a nice punchy bottom end where I can support a band. And then I had a clip of playing in the band. I was like, oh yeah, I am a fucking bass player actually as well. <laughs> and I like these strings because also on the same gig, I can do this and play a melodic solo and it sounds pretty in the high end. I was like, sure. great, yeah. mission accomplished. I have a good foundation and a good starting point and I'm really happy with that. It's Are not you for a everyone. DR guy? I am, yeah. yeah. For, I've got a question for a few years years now. more yeah. about basses, just to keep yeah, it around yeah. basses for a minute. Sure. Um, through the, because you started obviously in a wall. Yeah. Then the Federas, then Madison, and then yep. recently F bass, right? What's the, like. Yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah, that. the F bass. Like, <laughs> what's, what's the through line? What's the sort of like the dots that, that connect all those instruments? Other than the obvious, it's E to C, right? So other than that, what's the through line? And also, what has changed? So what what's the same, what's changed over the last okay, 20, well, I, 20 or more years? I think like, maybe not everyone, but I think like a lot of people in the beginning, I had a hero. You know, you, we, I think we all have that person. Sometimes it's John Entwistle, sometimes it's Jacob Astorius. Um, for me, I, I came to those people through Lawrence Cottle, who mm. was my mentor as a kid. You know, I wanted to be a drummer. Um, one of my best friends as a kid took me to, he's like, yeah, hey, let's go to this jazz gig in Croydon at the Gun Tavern, you know, Sunday lunchtime. Typical, sorry, Ian, like typical English thing, jazz gig in a pub. Love it. Sunday lunch, a bunch of people <laughs> getting wrecked and listening to Autumn Leaves, you know, this is like, it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. dog and duck, you, you name it. So I went along and I was like, 
fuck, that is what I want to do for mm. the rest of my life. One song in. Wow. So that's where the wall thing came from because Lawrence Got was it. playing wall, Lawrence wall bases and still he had the Working Man's 15, the SWR combo oh, yeah. amp and, the, yeah. and I was just like, holy shit. What I didn't realize obviously at the time because I'd never been conscious of who Jacko Pistorius was was that a lot of his playing came from Jacko. So mm. through knowing him and through getting into the music like immediately, within minutes, like that was a Sunday, Monday I went out and got a bass. Wow. Yeah. And Tuesday, he was stupid enough or foolish enough to have given me his phone number and I called him on Tuesday. So from Sunday to Tuesday, I went from being a drummer to a bass player to having a mentor. Like it was, and he was, I mean, I kind of don't know anyone else like that who, uh, when was that? That was 94, mm. 95, yeah. 94 maybe. Mm. And I was 15, I, I don't know. Uh, and he took me under his wing. Like he would come pick me up and take me to his gigs. Yeah, and I yeah, would sit there yeah. with a little, uh, like with a little tape machine and record yeah. them all and then you know a uh, uh, liquor license in the uk is like they used to be 11 o'clock everything closed right so mm. 11 o'clock i knew i was going to be home by 11 30 and i could practice until two or three in the morning wow just listening to the dictaphone and like learning yeah. all the shit so that's where the wall thing came mm. from you know and uh, eventually like before i left for the states in 96 i think it was he hooked me up with pete the fish um not the original yeah. original but one of the original builders of wall bases and Pete, I mean, Pete did me such an unbelievable deal. I think, I mean, I'm going to make every wall owner cry right now. And uh, Pete's no longer with us, so I don't, I don't mind sharing this information financially speaking. But I think it was like 1,200 bucks for two five strings. Wow. <laughs> I mean, 1,200 yeah, pounds yeah. at the time. I mean, it was yeah. fucking yeah, insane. Yeah, yeah. You know what right, I mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that was my first intro to like custom bases, and mm. that was through Lawrence. And I liked it for the wah wah. <laughs> that was it. I mean, I, of course, yes. my hero was playing it, and th they felt good. I'd found one in a junk store in Scotland for seven hundred pounds, a four-string yeah. fretless, while I was up playing the Edinburgh Fringe, Fringe Festival for a month, and they didn't know what they had, and they should have probably sold it for a lot more. So I had that, and I was like, "Oh shit, this is." I had like a Washburn, two hundred pound Washburn, or some really not a great. Sorry, Washburn, but they were not great entry-level bases. Yeah, and I was like, "Oh, this is an upgrade." Yeah, right. I can definitely get a lot more. You know, we talk about like, is a custom bass worth it? Should you spend this many thousands of dollars? Well, yeah, if you're serious about the music, I think you should. And and you really, mm. when you go from a squire to a wall, it's like, oh. You notice. Yes, there's yes. a little extra yeah. range there. So that was that. I went to Berkeley. I met Mitch Cohn. I don't know if you know who this guy is, bass player. Um, he was there with Tony Gray and me and Mark Kelly. Yeah. And Mitch Cohn was in the Waking Vision trio with Martin Valihora. He was also in Hiromi's first album. Yes. So he was one of the first yeah. players. I think him and Anthony yeah. Jackson and maybe Tony Gray were on the first record. And he had a Federa and introduced me to Vinny and Joey. So that's where the, the Federa thing started that's in maybe Federa, 98 yeah. or 99. Yeah. And then it was like I'd seen Matt Garrison. And I was like, oh, this is a whole other dimension of electric bass playing I didn't know about, wasn't aware of. I'm like fresh faced off the boat from England going to the regatta bar to see Garrison play with John Schofield. I was like, oh, this is interesting. Okay. Come to find out he got a lot of his stuff from Dominic Di Piazza. So I go yeah. back and check out the front page album with Borelli Legrain. Is this and... when the E to C thing happened? Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, around that time. I didn't realize that Dominique had been doing that since like 79, since mm. I was one year old. And <laughs> wow. that's where Matt had got it from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's all these lineage things, right? obviously he did right? the stuff like... with McLaughlin, didn't he? So he was into, pro yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Matt was playing with John. He was playing with uh, Zawinul. He was playing with Schofield. He was playing with Stern. Like he had just moved back from Italy not that long ago where he had grown up and gone to high school. And he was playing, just playing. Everyone was calling him because he was Matt Garrison. He was Jimmy Garrison's son. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Jack Dijonet's his godfather. He was living in Woodstock, doing all this crazy stuff. And obviously a ridiculous bass player. So quite rightly so. He's doing all these gigs. He's very visible and a big inspiration to a lot of people in my hour uh, especially in New York in our kind of generation yeah, yeah, and yeah. age range. So I switched E to C. I thought that was fantastic. I'd always heard melody. I'd always heard chords. Yes. I'd always been inspired by that. I'd always spent most of my time transcribing more on the melodic and chordal side of things. Um, so that facilitated that. I got the Federa. And then the E to C has just been a constant for 20 something years now. So that's one of the, the through lines between all the bases, yeah. Yeah, I would say that. And then... I talked about it in that video a little bit, like the business side of things is, was just pants. You know, there was someone very specific in the management, not Vinny or Joey, they're beautiful people and I love them dearly. Um, but there was someone on the management side of things that just was not happening at Federa, which made me think like, 
you know, if if one more fan came to me and said, "Hey, I love your bass. I love the way you play. I really want to play that instrument, but I need to buy a fucking car this month. Yeah, you know, yeah I can't yeah, spend fifteen thousand dollars on a custom yeah. instrument. Can right. you do something about that?" Yeah. So that's why I tried with Matteson. Didn't work because they just didn't have the infrastructure. Yeah. But no you played the reason. Matteson no. for a long time, right? Like yeah, I started that in 2017 and only got the F bass like a year ago. So I, and it's amazing. I've still got it. It's back there. I've got like I got it's three Matteson. I've got a Henry like a hole in the top. It's like, semi hollow. Yeah. 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 Like uh, and as uh, I was literally in the car driving from Stockholm Airport out to um, Kumla, where he lives in the, in the right in the boonies in the middle of the woods, and he's like calling me on the phone. He's like, uh, before I play it for the first time, I don't know what I've done, but I think I've made you a fucking pan flute. And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> like this, and he's playing it over the phone to me. <laughs> yeah, get it, dude. Oh, come on, just run into the back. I wonder if we he's gotta lying. see it. Yeah, we'll see, we'll find out. I wonder. What's the weight of it, Yannick? Is it is it quite light? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think I've made you a fucking pan flute. <laughs> that was how That's that conversation great. Was. That's great. The oh, weight, funny. it's not, yeah, it's light because it's semi, like half the body's chambered. Yeah. So, so a lot lighter than the Federa was. Yeah. And it's 32 yeah. inch scale. Mm. Um, we went with 32 and a half. Marcel recommended that for the F bass, which was mm. kind, is kind of cool. I'm digging that. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to get out of the rat race of the business side of bass, really. What so in I terms bought, of the I, signature uh, signature? Yeah, I didn't. I just didn't want to go through it anymore. And I, I called Marcel and I said, "Hey, can you? I want to buy a bass. Can you just? I just want no connection to any company. Period. Like they never posted the fact that I have an F bass. I never really talked about it until last month. And it's just like the social media thing. Just like strip away all the noise, focus on what's important. You know, to me. And what's What's the F bass made of? Is it like, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Hold it, I'll tell you. You could probably you tell me by, I think it's uh, spalted, is that spalted maple facing? Yeah. yeah. Flip it and over? then I think it's it's an ash neck, maybe. Oh, it's like mahogany body in an ash neck, yeah. Mahogany body, ash neck, there you go, yeah. Th through, I had to make it like, make a through. I was thinking about getting a bolt on, I wasn't sure. It's oh, because they normally do bolt ons, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, so it was kind of a custom neck. But great, I, I picked it up, I played it. It's like, oh, it's a bass. Sounds like me. Is it, not gonna be a it. Is it not going to be a signature model? Oh, I fucking hope not, no. I just, don't <laughs> want the, the, I just don't want the ball ache of it all. It's like, what do I really get out of it? Yeah. Four and a half, five percent on on ten sales over the next five years. I don't need it, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, no, I get it. I think that, um, like, Ian and I have talked about it a lot in terms of, I think that that, was important back in the day in a few different ways you know it was important for bass players who were building like let's say sort of like for instance gary willis like it was important for gary willis and his career that um especially for you know fans like us that we saw him in the magazines and he had the signature bass and it was yeah. he was like the, the whole package right and i think that things have just changed so much now that you don't necessarily need anything like that. You don't need endorsements. Well, we're, we're talking about a planet that doesn't orbit anymore. We're talking about a dead planet. Like we're not even in the same solar system as what you just mentioned. And I agree with you. I think it was important. And I think more to the point, there were important people that did it rather than the act of having a signature base being important. I think yeah. Gary's a, an amazing example of that because he's so yeah. knowledgeable on a technical level. And he really was like, no, I want these tuners. He's a freak to... show dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, He's the guy truly... building his own pedals and, you know, knows yeah. everything about electronics and f fingerboard radius and fret height and all that stuff. And I think it was a, 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 a 25 year history of him innovating, yeah. which I've got yeah. all the time in the world for yeah. just slapping your name on an instrument and being like, yeah, show me the money. That's what it is today, yeah. I think. And mm, I think I'm that's what happened with... Because... Go on. I'm, I'm smiling because Gary's like, I'm not sure. Like, do you know him well? Do you, like, you Very interviewed well. him for the podcast, right? You know, oh, sort yes. of like, so 20 do you know, sort of like years. his extracurricular stuff. Like, oh, yeah. Have you seen any biking. photography? The, yeah, the photography, photography stuff, yeah. the videos. It's yeah. hilarious. He's, he's yeah. so freaking nerdy. I love yeah. it. He's a super nerd, man. <laughs> yeah. Super nerd. Yeah. And yeah, yeah I, 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 I really, I think that happened now. It's, it's like such a, I need to make a video about that like about endorsements. I made a podcast episode about it, but I need to do a visual reference of like, no one is endorsed by a company. 
Mm. And that's something that everyone gets wrong right now. And in all these Instagram bios, it's like endorsed by Deodario Strings, endorsed by Ernie Ball Music Man Basis. No, you're fucking not. Why would they endorse your unknown ass? They want you to advertise their product. They want you to endorse their product so that they can sell more. Like, I think people really get that wrong. But that's a culture thing now. That's a culture thing. Like, I remember the last NAM show I went to, and hopefully it was the last NAM show I went to, um, standing on the Aguilar booth and listening in my periphery to a line of people who had just left Berkeley coming up and saying, hey, I've got 125,000 Instagram followers. What can you do for me? Mm. I was like, yes. Okay, mm. well, what, are you, what have you done mm. besides accrue Instagram followers? Have you done literally anything besides graduate Berkeley, which is fucking pointless, right? Because <laughs> that tells us nothing about like who you are or what you can do or where we might be able to like work together on something meaningful. So there's, there's that culture. They're just looking for the validation so they can grow their online presence more, I think. They're looking for that, like be able to put the logo and the name, you know, I of a big company. So. But I will say that, like, if I was just out of Berkeley and I was, like, 20 year old, I'd maybe be in that line as well. I'd be like, hey, I've got 125,000 followers. And maybe I'd just be doing it because I just didn't know. I just didn't know. And I'm just trying to sort of, like, I'm trying I to I think scratch, that's the scary thing, though, right? Climb away like, up They don't ladder. know. But we didn't know, right? Oh, no. Yeah, we did. Well, I think there because was Because we a- knew that there, there was such a barrier to entry when we were was- 21. There was, there was no model. choice. There was no choice but to work hard and seek out the 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 right people. Yeah, like it felt nobody impossible. was coming to you. You had to go to them. Like now, hundreds of thousands of people are coming to these people via right. social media yes. and yeah. validating whatever bullshit. And sometimes it's not bullshit. Sometimes it's amazing. But people are validating it regardless. The audience is less educated than they were twenty years ago because they don't have to think and they don't have to work to get access to anything. It is. I think it's the same from both sides, and they're sort of doing doing a little bit of this right now. And like you said, messy middle. I think perhaps that could change and go up again. Yeah. But right now, the barrier to entry is zero. There are mm. no gatekeepers, and you can get validation right now, tomorrow. Like you can grow a YouTube channel to a million followers in a month. There are tons of cases of people doing this. Yeah. But for what? Like, what did you do to do that? Did you provide any value? Did you contribute to society? 20 years ago, to get a million fans, oh my God, you had to do something pretty earth shattering to reach that many people. Yeah. That you have to have something original to say, I think, and be really motivated and hardworking to, 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 to pull it off. I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's, it, the, that's the way I see it. It's interesting. Yeah. Like I've got, so I've got a, a lot of things buzzing around my head. I think that there was, there was definitely more of a model to follow back then. I'm, I'm not so necessarily convinced that people aren't putting in the hard work because I think that to gain the followers, they will be putting hard work in, whether it's, hard work into the thing that they should be focusing on or whether they sh- should be splitting their time you know whether because right. i think it's the, also dangerous because of like you get young people who who are not developed like the brain isn't developed the people that are under 25 years old especially and there are like two very distinct categories i think of male and female and like what girls young girls feel like they're forced to do in order to gain recognition or validation is Mm. super scary like as a as a father of a daughter oh my god i'm not looking forward to that conversation of like when do i give her a cell phone you know what i mean yeah and how do i help her through like you know what this is well i and where how do i help her through like hey by the way this is not this is not reality oh yeah yeah i've got 11 year old 11 year old daughter yeah. Oh, there you go. Um, the the small the small bit of advice that I would give is um, I don't think it's about rest, uh, restricting access. I think it's about teaching. It's not about preparing the path for the child. It's preparing the child for the path. Right. So, for instance, when I entered the shark infested waters of YouTube on a giant <laughs> platform like SBL, right. people came for me, and I would read all of the negative comments to my kids. And we would figure out how to respond or if we should respond. And we would talk about, because they all want to be YouTubers. That's they don't want to be musicians. That's balanced. <laughs> well, I mean, it was, I, for, for me, for me, it's like, um, I, I I see negative comments uh, with empathy. Like I see them yeah. as like, oh, you're in a bad place, right? Because it's the yeah. only way I can do it. 
Uh, and then, so yeah, I would just read them. We, I, like, and in fact, we celebrate them. When I get a, a nasty comment from someone that isn't about critique, actually about making the content better, but that's actually just mean and spiteful, I celebrate it. I go, hey, you guys, check it out. We got it. And we we huddle around and then we decide, like, how should we, should we leave this alone? How should we, or how should we respond? Because I think there is no... I've seen the negatives on both sides. Cell phone too early. Uh oh, now you're you're watching TikTok at nine. But I've also I have friends that have kids that they haven't let them have a phone, and now they're thirteen, fourteen. They're missing out. They're yeah. ostracized, and then they yeah. seek it in ways. And now the parent is not involved, and you do not want that. It's so, like the drinking yeah. age in America being twenty one. Like it's there's it's yeah, crazy. So many issues for yeah, sure. Right, right. And and I think it's. It's taken me a long time. I don't know what you guys' experience is with this. You've been around it. I think all of us probably just as long. It's taken a long time to be able to step back and say, oh, you just don't know. You could be having a bad day. I'm going to have empathy for that. I'm not going to give you a hard time for having a bad day and lashing out. That's that's you. That doesn't actually affect me at all. But also when you read something that is so uninformed, you have to say, oh, you've just never been in the room. Hmm. You have no... Oh, yeah. Yeah, concept right. of what happened or what might happen or how it happens so it makes it way easier to to let that sort of fall by yes. the wayside and yes. brush it off that's a realization Absolutely. i came to maybe five or six years ago but now what i'm doing with the youtube channel the reboot i'm trying to hit this goal of a hundred thousand subscribers by april on towards a million blah 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 but i'm committing to reading every comment in the first 48 hours of the mm. video going live and answering every question holy shit was that a suicide mission? <laughs> <laughs> you can change your mind. <laughs> On the whole, I, I gotta say, no, I, I gotta say like 96.87% has been positive, which is great. You know, it's yes. just like the negative ones are like, whoa. Heavy, yeah. Where's that coming from? Like, Do you think that some of the negative comments are coming from just people wanting to be noticed? It's all attention, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's that's what that is. It's always attention when somebody says something negative that is unnecessary. They're not saying something negative that will then contribute to your life and and help you in a way. They're not you I think you can be constructively empathetic, right? Agreed. I don't think it's maybe the first stop, and I don't think you can do that unless you know someone very well and a public right. forum is not the place for that, but it right. is it is kind of an option, right? Yeah, it is for sure. Yeah. I agree. But definitely nobody's doing that. <laughs> <laughs> when, they, when they come in the YouTube comments. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. People yeah. people want, um, they want you to notice them. I've noticed yeah. that too. Like they want, they want you to engage. There's like a, if I say this, it's going to make Yannick yeah. respond. Because if they say, Yannick, you're wonderful, eh, you're going to blow by that. I mean, well, that's you, that's base forums, period, right? Yes, that's exactly. Basechat.co.uk and talkbase.com talk base, yeah. for the most part. Of course. Uh, pr I, somebody, send me something on i gotta really uh police my friends now that i'm off social media and say hey do, does he, do i really need to open this when you send me this link you know i have to be really careful about it because i'm not seeing it anything that happens live so people sure. are, like sending me things here and there so i saw something on reddit recently and i was like oh you just don't get it like mm. and people's concept of fact like i it's kind of fascinating like the human condition where where, where somebody like where do you decide that this is fact mm. and when do you decide that you need to share that with the world as as fact can you disclose what that was uh what did they say shit i wish i could i'd love to read it verbatim actually but it was something along the lines of ah it was all about the federa thing leaving mm -hmm. federa going to madison leaving madison going to f base although i didn't go there i, I bought one and right. people were basically saying this was all financially motivated mm -hmm. that oh you're just Going to you go going to Madison because you make more money than Federa. Federa, this kind of huge company now, Madison, one guy in a shed in the woods. Right, they, they couldn't have been more wrong. It was just hilarious yeah. knowing all those people the way I do. Like, where do you connect those dots and then feel the need to share in a public forum? That's an interesting element of the internet to me mm. uh, that none of us are immune to, I guess. Yes, where, where they're taking something and, and making almost some a factual claim. 100%, that is yeah. that is not indeed a factual claim at all. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like me commenting on 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 a on a on a murder case as though I was in the room watching it happen. You know. <laughs> yeah. But but just to say, like that happens. You know, like somebody's yeah, right. Somebody's gone missing in the UK over the last uh, the last couple of weeks, 
And interestingly enough, it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's warfare in the comments of any YouTube video or anything that's made. Everybody's got an opinion of what happened oh, yeah. on all of that shit. So I think it's just, it's just how it is online. And I think that, um, yeah, you got to learn not to look or yeah. get really disconnected with it. And I think that there's two different types of criticism as well. Criticism that is, you know, that has no substance at all, which there's lots of, but also criticism that has substance and they're actually, and being able, being able to bounce from one comment to the other and being able to see that, and not yeah. like reading somebody that's just sort of like lashing out, whatever they're, they're trying to make themselves feel better today. They say something, then moving on to the next comment and that actually having some substance and not <laughs> right. actually carrying the emotional side of this last comment to this comment is yeah. really hard because yeah. some people do actually care. I think that some right. people that do, that do care. A hundred percent. Oh, yep. it's, it's and a whole thing. How about the yeah. truth? Like when you finally read a comment and they're right mm. and you're like, yeah. oh, you know what? I did fuck that up, mm. you know? And you're like, oh, shit. that hurts the most. That like, hurts that's the actually most. the only one that hurts is yes. when you're like, oh, shit, you know what? When you're they, 100% right. When they get you. Know? you. Yeah. And especially when they, they don't really do it even meanly. It's just right. like they call you out on your shit and you're like, oh, yes. crap. Yeah, yeah absolutely. you're totally right. And sometimes right. they're totally wrong as well. Sometimes they're yes. totally wrong. Yeah, sure. I'll yeah. give you a great example of when I got absolutely burned So, um, and had to actively ignore everybody. It was a really... Um, interesting space to be in at the time it is when we started first doing the vlogs on the channel so i'd been uploading regular you know just lessons what have you to the can i the guess channel. what the can comments I guess? said no can i just guess the sentiment because i'd love to know if i was right before you say it oh go for it was your current audience just not into the format yeah absolutely yeah they hammered you for being something that you hadn't been already. They hammered, they hammered you for change. Hammered me. Yeah, hammered me. Yeah. 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 Hammered okay. me. Good. And I'm glad I'm not and, the only one. <laughs> oh yeah. Hammered me. And and the interesting thing about it was, and knowing I should have there was a there was ways around it. And I and I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. If if I was living that again, what I would have done. But um hindsight and all that. But it was it was getting absolutely ham like every single comment. And I'm talking like 500 comments. Yeah. Like yeah. it was a blaze in there. <laughs> and um, and I'm looking at the analytics and the subscribers were just going like. Up. Like, oh, like, yeah, yeah like 900,000 people a day. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is, so I was in this really interesting situation of, I'd done a handbrake turn on the on the content yeah um the the older audience that that i'd um that had subscribed before and hated it but it was just you know the youtube algorithm loved it and and, and lots of other people did love it people were like wow this sure. is awesome you know it's not it's not as dry there's actually i can follow you around doing yeah. the sort of like the whole vlog thing and stuff like that so i actively decided to ignore it and i just went flat out straight into it and just ignored yeah. all the comments and after about, you know about two months or whatever it did die down but in hindsight i think i wish i um i think i wish i would have i should have put something on the channel that just said hey here's what's going on here's why i made the change here's the analytics and showed them because somebody at one stage there was another um i've had a lot of sort of like threads and stuff written about me over the last decade, right? You can imagine, right? Yeah. So there's a thread somewhere on talk base or base chat or whatever, right? And somebody's going guns are blazing. And and I actually made a video. And and I made a video to it to directly to I guess sort of like explain the circumstances. And that was really interesting because I've done this a bunch of times, actually. I've done it maybe like three or four times. And every single yeah. time it was exactly the right thing to do. So you know, because it just gives them context. You're like, hey, I'm a I'm a human, right. you know, by the way, and, and here's probably the context that you don't see. And everyone's like, oh, no shit. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then in that thread... And they hear it from the horse's mouth, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah, right. yeah. And then in that thread, somebody, a few of them had also sort of like jumped on the hair, you know, he changed his content, you know, blah, blah, blah. I wish he didn't do that anymore, right. et cetera. And I was like, oh, I'll make another video about that as well. And holy shit, it was a mate. Everybody was like, wow. I didn't fully appreciate how 
wildly disconnected people are from the the back end of of how youtube works oh yeah and nobody yes. knows anything about it really you yeah know? i i just assumed that people knew and what a freaking dumbass thing to think right but i just assumed <laughs> that oh they must all know well, i didn't even think that it was just sort of like an inbuilt assumption right and when i shared that and saw people's reactions i was like oh shit i should have just all i needed to do is just be open about it to the channel and say hey you know like i'm at a crossroads um if i go down this direction it's great i'm gonna you know please everybody that i've already got but it's going to be look at my numbers they're dwindling right or i go in this direction and i've got a real chance to make something awesome and i'm not sure how it's going to end up and i know that a lot of people are going to be grumpy about it but just hang with me i'm just going to do this for a few months i'll right. communicate about it as i do it and and come with me on this adventure and we'll see what happens i freaking should have done that i didn't do that but there you go Fine, well, and, and that's kind of what i'm doing now with like splitting up the channels i used to put everything on one channel but now i have a dedicated podcast channel i have a clips channel i'm doing a channel all in spanish i'm having my videos translated to spanish and dubbed yeah because of that you know so that people get to exist in the lane they want to exist in so nobody mm -hmm. kind of gets alienated i don't have to explain it all the fucking time you know just and the, the the balance as well of like I want to talk about music at some point, you know. <laughs> All I do is sit around and play music and write music and record music and think about music. And the, the only thing yeah. that ever gets seen is like, oh, so this pedal has some glitchy, you know, uh, ambient delay. Yeah. Uh, that, that's oh, a really yeah, that's a really interesting position to be in because obviously yes. it's like it's like the clickbait title thing, isn't it? You're stuck in a a situation where you have to and goddamn Van Nystadt. He's like, he sort of like does, he navigates around this beautifully, doesn't he? You know, like it's, it's, he does. Yeah, he has his own style. You, cl you click on that video, he hasn't sort of, he hasn't, I don't want to say like the word cheapened, but it's, but he's not optimizing in the same way that Jimmy's optimizing. No, although, not at all. Not although, at all. check check it out. Interesting thing I realized recently was uh, from Jimmy, uh, from Mr. Beast was, Use a clickbait title, use a fancy thumbnail, but deliver on the clickbait in the first eight seconds of the yes, video. Yes. Do not yeah, say one thing and yeah. do another. Do not say, this is the best Valentine's Day gift for your husband or wife, and then open the video with 20 seconds of doing groceries with your cousin. You know, like yeah. deliver yeah. on the thing that it says in the, th in the thumbnail and the title, and I think you can do that. And you don't have to be creating squid games or, or you know, being Which buried is alive for 50 hours. just an video. Like, how did oh, they pull that? Have you seen the making of it? It's insane. Yeah, I saw, saw the whole thing. I mean, it's, it's incredible. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me, though. That's the thing. Like, now I understand the entire lineage and history of his thing. Yeah. It surprises me actually more that he hasn't done that more hmm. because of the way he operates and because of the sheer volume of money he has and continues to pump into production and all the lanes. Like, he has somebody just offered him a billion dollars for all of his channels, right? Wow. And he's like, I saw somebody do a financial breakdown of it. Didn't even was, think about it, like, because he's like, it's worth ten times that. Yeah, that there's a guy, there's a guy I follow online, and uh, he he actually did a video, and it was yeah. like why Jimmy was right to knock this back. What's and the guy's name? A, Paddy, the Irish guy, Paddy something. Oh, uh, that guy's great. It wasn't that guy. Awesome. It wasn't that guy, guy, but he does yeah, things that guy's like that. Awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like, yeah, it's surprising me that he hasn't done more like that. And I'm sure he will. And what was interesting was for me trying to figure out like, do I have to do this every week? Do I have mm. to do three a month? Do I have to do one a month? You look at Mark Rober, for instance, does one yeah. every like three months sometimes and has more views actually the Mr. Beast on a lot of his videos. Yeah. It's with, incredible. Once yeah. Every, with, with 12 videos a year or something. Yeah, that's it's right. It's incredible, yeah. And but I, just getting back to my original point, though, and I think that we were like with, with Van Nuys, that thing, yeah. is that I think, it, and, and you saying, oh, do I have to, you know, make a, another, you know, video about this pedal or whatever. I do find that an interesting space to be in because I understand that it's, and if anybody's listening, wondering what the, what, what are we even talking about? What we're, just let me sort of like, break it down because i think it can be a little like smoke through your fingers in a way if you don't understand what we're talking about it's like we're having to not cheapen the content but if yannick wanted to make the perfect content for him it might be different to for the audience right for for you 100%. Yannick, yeah exactly for you i imagine it would be kind of sort of like arty van nyestat it's going to be abstract it's going to be you know 
it's gonna it's not gonna be boom boom you know like what well, choppy here's choppy, the thing here's the that thing that about shit. that though is that yeah, if I were to sit here at the piano and explain like triads over dominant chords and really talk about lush harmony and melody and motivic development and composition, it's not right for YouTube. It's not that it's not right for the audience because mm. I can make these super fast paced videos about well-known topics that I'm still honestly passionate about yeah. and grow this audience and get those people out to the show. And those people that come out to the show will be the same people that want to know about the triads over the dominant chord. Right. But it's that center locator point of YouTube that is like, uh, no, forget it. We are not the place to, 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 to do that. Even though they want to be connected with what I have to say most passionately, YouTube is not the place of connection for that. Because yeah. the algorithm will go, nah, fuck you. We don't, we don't <laughs> yeah, want this. Exactly. We don't want you yeah. to take 30 minutes explaining B flat, flat nine. You know, like, <laughs> the, the fuck you. The algorithm dictates the content, right? right. To a certain yes. extent, the algorithm dictates the content. And if so, any, anybody's listening to this as well and thinking, well, I'm not sure about that, you might be thinking about <laughs> videos that existed more like five or 10 years ago. And that algorithm yeah. changes every single month. And yeah. right now, the algorithm more and more dictates the, the style of content that we can create and yeah and, and, and just way, like we're trying yeah. to wean my daughter off the formula and put more almond milk in the formula bottle i've got to try to sneak more harmony and more <laughs> music and melody into my videos and yeah. wean the audience over to something that they already want to know about yeah and are super passionate about and i have to deliver that in a like in a chunk like this yeah, yeah. that's sneaking the spinach in the smoothie they there yeah. have been sort of like incredible youtubers though that have managed to like i'm a big nerd about format um, i think that it's all about the format of the video 100 Espe especially when it comes to being scalable right you want to find a format that's replicable so you can keep you know you don't have to sort of like create a piece of art or, or i mean like a, a work of art every time you release a video yeah you want it to be good but you want them to be some kind of like system and blueprint that you can use so yeah uh, for youtube you do yeah for me i don't <laughs> Like, yeah, no, for you, you don't, but for which YouTube. is a crazy balance to strike. You know, like I look at, I've made, I think, 13 albums now, and they're all completely different. Yeah, they're mm. all, but it's a, and it's the a, it's only a mandate I have when I go yeah. in the studio again is I can't do anything that I did before. Mm. And right now, I'm struggling with that with YouTube. Mm. And the last four videos have been like eight minutes, 14 minutes, 10 minutes, and today, four and a half minutes. So, I'm we, to your point a bit about being nerdy about format, I'm experimenting with length right now. We're finding, yeah. just to get into the weeds, we're finding that short videos for us specifically, and I see that, say this with a sort of like big fat caveat of the algorithm trains itself to your particular channel as well. Yeah. So I can say, hey, longer videos are working for us and short videos seem to be bombing. Yeah. That might not be the case with your videos, but it certainly is with ours at the minute. Like when we're doing a video under, under like under 10 minutes, we're nervous about it. And what we've had great success with over the last a um, few months is like 14, 15 minutes, even right up to like 19, 20 minutes. Right. So I think and that's that what I used to have success with. But one of the things about making videos under five minutes is if you make enough of them, they become bingeable and yeah. people will stick around. So the session time might be short on one video, but the total session time mm. on your channel is going to be long because they'll sure. watch eight of them. And suddenly they went from a nine minute session time to a 35 minute session time. It's, you know, you've done the research. I've done it. We're all doing it all the time, listening to podcasts. <laughs> it, yeah. Who yeah. knows what's going to work when? And like you said, it's changing every month, yeah. literally changing the, every month. You know, the reason why I mentioned formats though, is that some people have nailed a format for like, Hey, Here's these chords. They're actually teaching teaching theory, but they're being really creative with the the format of it. And it's generally yeah. straight into the you know straight into the content. It's yeah, for the most I mean, part. Neely still, does that, right? Adam yeah, does that. Yeah, his whole would, thing is video essays on music harmony. Yeah, yeah music right. the ones that the ones that I'm thinking. I can't remember the guy that does them, but the ones that I'm referencing or thinking about right now are much more practical they're sort of like more hey here's some gospel chords here's how it works this is why but interestingly they're all on keys they're all on oh, keys yeah, and yeah. I actually and I think that that from a visual perspective really makes a difference I think the reason why sure. there's a lot of drum Instagrammers YouTubers with large followings is number one the demographic of the drum niche is bigger but also other musicians love watching drummers play 
I sure. think it's a really visual instrument, so I think that that matters as well. And we just have to accept the bass is the small. Well, okay, maybe accordion is a little smaller, but in the terms of the big four or five, you know, popular instruments, <laughs> bass is the small niche. Yeah, for sure. You know, yeah. the audience is limited. Yeah. You know, people like you with a million plus, Adam Neely getting close to two million. We know the audience is there for yeah. sure. Yeah. But it's like to convince them to come out of the woodwork and engage is. A little I bit would more love of a challenge. to know how, like, of Adam Neely's, you know, followers, how many are bass players? I would love to know that. Hmm. Well, I think I, that's what he's. That's why he's closer to two million than one now, is because probably mostly not. Right. He yeah, makes videos not, yeah. about pop tunes by Katy Perry. This is a much wider audience. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there are obviously enough bass players to sell five, six hundred tickets a night at a venue. You know, he sold out. Uh, I know because they were there just before us at a band on the wall. In Mank, and uh, they had to Sun put the Gazer. chairs back in. Yeah, they had oh, to put the yeah. chairs back in for us, you know? <laughs> this shit works. Like, Corey Wong, like, a friend of mine was videoing his, um, video, you know, his, video, his, video on his show down, I think it was like Brixton Academy or something like that. It was freaking sold out. Yeah. And he said he couldn't believe it. He said he, he walked in, he was like... Corey Wong couldn't believe it? The same guy who no, sold out Madison Square? No, oh, no, the no, video not guy. Corey. <laughs> the video guy, yeah. He walked in and he was like... Oh my word! Okay, he was like, yeah. "This is insane." Yeah. And like, Corey is a a product, really, of what, what we're talking about right now. You know, hundred percent Wolfpack yeah. and all of that. You know, and yeah. having his big TV show. You know, building out a stage and a set, and you know, it's being Johnny Carson. It's outlandishly cool, isn't it? Like, I love it. Yeah, I love it. It's it's a lot of work, man. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've uh, I, I've I didn't grow up as young with Corey, but I did a bunch of sessions and gigs and stuff with Corey because we're both Minneapolis. Oh, um, Minneapolis, right? Yeah. yeah. Before he yeah. exploded, and been on you know a bunch of records with him, like when he was producing. And what I saw from a very very early time with Corey is that he was just so incredibly high output in his so thinking. You and Steve Gould say right? We, we, yeah, high Steve and output. I. Steve and I just are always like high output. It's Corey high output wong 100 yeah. like i remember being on a record and and um it was phoebe Cadis and uh cory is uh producing and on one hand he was editing a photo on a laptop and then he was responding to a text and then sort of simultaneously able to listen to verse two and wonder about that bass moment for me and wonder about that that fill right. that steve played and yes multitasker and and so aimed at like going and never wasting yeah. time and it was just really interesting to see because i'm it's far like more of me <laughs> <laughs> right I, I, mean... I mean it's like exactly <laughs> like me but i was doing that pre youtube <laughs> and pre the internet you know what i mean i was like yeah, yeah. there's one moment in the documentary about the last album where juan pablo who i used to he used to engineer and i used to produce and we did that we maybe have done a hundred records in a decade together in New York. We were nonstop in the studio and he gets asked a question by the film crew and he's like, man, do you think he is, he has high output now? Man, you should see 20 years ago. Man, I cannot keep up. I'm like I'm fucking running behind, you know? And that was like our dynamic. I was like, we're going to this studio. Now we're doing this record. It was nonstop, wow, yeah. but it was analog, Yeah, you know, completely yeah, analog yeah, yeah. and like, I appreciate the fact that a lot of my career was analog. It's just hard to reconcile that fact now mm. when that is basically zero at the moment. Mm. Not not mm. quite zero, but almost there in terms of the other side of, of digital and how much bandwidth that takes up. It's really, uh, that's a common thread of, amongst musicians. I think my age and a little, our age rather, and a little older. It's like, how do we reconcile that? And it's interesting yeah, to see yeah. the people like our age and up to 10 years older who aren't the legends who are just coasting out on the 80s and the 90s being great for them, yes. how do they survive, you know? Like, what has Matt Garrison done as an artist in the past oh, decade? It fell off the map, you know? We like, can't, we can't, he just stopped. We can't have a conversation about it because I'm going to have to skip in like five minutes because it's my kid's bedtime. I need to stick oh, shit, in bed. Okay. <laughs> but I do think about that a lot. I yeah. think that... It and I'm not was... trying to rag on him, by the way. I'm just saying, like, that he's a product of that time. He obviously started a venue. He did a, a bunch of stuff. Like, he did a bunch of stuff. I'm not saying he just disappeared, but he wasn't doing it publicly, and he wasn't following on from this early success of what made him who he is. And I think that's just one 
very recognizable example of many people who are like that, you know, of yeah, that like, age range. Like Hadrian was saying a couple of Hadrian, months ago that like yeah. Jim Beard stop think about stop playing like something oh, yeah. around that. that yeah, yep. it was, and I think that it's incredibly sad actually that um, to to see people like Matt, you know, Jim Beard, all of these other really fantastic musicians that grew up in a completely different model. It's and because technology and the speed that it moves, it's been really accelerated, and they've found yeah. themselves in a, sp a space that they do not understand. Right. And I'm and I'm not sure if I was in that space, I'd understand at that age either. I'd be like, yeah. "What even happened? Did like like what am I, I supposed to do now?" I think the yeah. '78 crew is like maybe in a pretty unit. '77 to '79 crew is in a, maybe a unique situation like that time wise in the, yeah. in the period of our lives that all of this stuff exploded and we had the luxury of some analog stuff before and some of us not all of us but some of us accepted and assimilated into the digital era and did something with it um it'd be interesting now, to know like and i'm sure that some some artists have really navigated it well you know like i'm <laughs> like older artists that were born before us and have navigated it well um I mean, like, like I can't is, think of anybody. It'd be great to. I'm sure they are out there. Like, well, Beato. in my mind, I was like, I was thinking about Beato, but it's different. Like, Beato didn't. He didn't do what he was doing before. You know, he he wasn't doing then what he does now. He mm. had sort of like a different career. Yeah, and he, he, he saw, pivoted. And yes, he pivoted. Yes, and he did it with like he's a beast, right? So, and he's done it in such a great way. But but he hasn't kind of like he hasn't cross the chasm he wasn't doing that career beforehand and then cross this chasm to a new reality and the reason why i think it might be so fucking hard to do is that you have all of these installed beliefs about how that how the world works around what you do right. and yeah. you have to basically strip all of that away and build it up and mm. and, and yeah, in our little maybe, world of yeah. In our little world of bass, I would cite people like uh, Tim Lefebvre mm -hmm. and James Genus, and th there are a bunch of people in there. Sean Hurley, who who are who are not that much older than me, but they're definitely they're definitely older than us, mm -hmm. and they managed to keep doing what they were doing. But they are like a small club of people who were like, we don't really need social media or YouTube. These people are not visible. Right. The, the James Genus. When was the last time you heard anything about James Genus yet? Mm -hmm. He's on yeah, Saturday Night like, Live. He's tours with Herbie Hancock. Yeah, but they're not artists. So I think that's the difference. That like what you what you, we're talking about here with you, for instance, analog to where we are now. That was as an like artist, the, as as an not artist, as a like side we, man. not yeah. as a side man. And the reason no. why, like you mentioned, Garrison, why I'm like, yeah, I agree, is because, because he was he more would, artistically inclined. Yeah, he was more more of an artist. Yeah, yeah, like he could do the side. I'm sure he could do the sideman gig, but he was like definitely more artistically inclined. Maybe so Schooley. Schooley doesn't ever really get involved with the internet yeah and he does I some pretty interesting sort of things like, yeah he does some really fantastic things but like somebody that existed before to a what certain about Patatucci, level you guys what about patatucci Ooh. <laughs> well Patat is funny man because yeah. john i've I mean, seen him yeah. trying to make a big push with his youtube channel and stuff recently um uh patatucci gets doesn't get a pass from me and i love him and he's a great he friend he doesn't he, he does not get a pass because he's he's too he's uh, so john i'm so sorry i'm <laughs> calling you too old but for this conversation <laughs> you're too old my friend um and he had too much of a career in like we're talking about a legend here yes 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 you, you might as well talk about will lee and 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 and, other, and gonna, nathan east and people like that going to survive any change uh, yeah when yes. you started with what were the records he was just talking about playing? I heard an interview. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like the amount of records he played on. Yeah. Who, John? You know, with a, yeah, with John, with a people in the 80s. Come on, like yeah. you're talking about yeah. someone that yeah. when I was in diapers, he was playing on massive, <laughs> massive records like Eddie Money or just huge, in LA and then touring with Chick Corea before he was 30 yeah. and becoming a legend before he was 30. Yeah. Like it, to me, he gets in the same category of the people 10 years older than him, like mm. Mike Stern and Randy Brecker and Wayne Krantz and all those people who are really living from the 80s and 90s and the popularity of what they did being so strong that their audience remained and they didn't mm. need to rely on building a new audience over again. They didn't need to reinvent themselves. You know what I mean? I don't think John does anything. Oh, one of you said something like you said, Beato mm. doesn't do now what he did then, right? Yes. Yeah. John does now what he did then. 
Right. That's your yeah. He's, he's right. not pivoting to start he's a YouTube pivoting. channel and change right. his career. He is an a hundred percent an artist right up the middle. Correct. A hundred percent integrity, completely honest with what he does. He's not pivoting at all. He may be using the medium to put out his music, but that is actually going to be the worst thing for his success in that lane. Mm. Like if he wants to make YouTube successful, he needs to pivot in the way he presents it. He can't just put, hey, this is a great bass performance. Yeah, John, it is. It's amazing. It's legendary. <laughs> and I will watch it 10 times a day, but only 10,000 other people agree with me, not a million. Right. Mm. Because of you format. Know? Because of the format, you know? And yeah. I, and I think that's what he'll do. Like he'll, what won't like diminish his integrity or his honesty in the way he presents his art. And mm. um, that will equal a less successful in massive air quotes uh foray into the youtube space i would imagine i know i know that our time is short scott oh, because shit, i know yeah. that but no 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 but i i, I have to that, i just can you I hear lisa say, texting me she's like <laughs> 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 i i i just uh yannick i have to yeah. tell you i know that you have made a commitment to jumping off of social i know you're not on insta anymore i yeah. just want to say i miss you I do. I miss. I don't you there. miss it. I hate. I appreciate it, but I don't miss it at all. I know, but those there apps are people... on my phone. I have an extra two hours in my day. <laughs> and if I... those listen, if those people miss it that much, they will yeah. go to YouTube. They'll subscribe to the channel. Definitely, and they'll get their tits knocked off with the level I'm trying to take the the <laughs> filmmaking to and the storytelling. I hope you know that's my that's my hope. Will and you? I hope they'll come to a show. Do, would you consider putting the same level? of what you do into your YouTube videos into short form, or do you already put it into short form no. in YouTube? Will you, I mean, you I'm going to take it? clips and make shorts. Sure. And I'm going to have a clips channel, but it'll still be four or five minute videos. Okay. You know, there aren't the hours in the day. I'd work 50 hours a day. If they were there, I'm a workaholic. I get up, I sleep five hours a night. I get up and I don't stop until I hit the, hit the pillow again. So, well, look, you might not do it, but I, I want to see Guizdala in short form, I want to see the Guizdala art of the video and music. I'll tell you how you can do that. Form. You can come to a gig and leave halfway through the first song. That's about as short as it's going to get. <laughs> Yannick, tell us, tell everybody where we can support you. You're not on Instagram. You're not on Spotify. Say, no Instagram. Where, where, where are we going to support you? Obviously, YouTube. Where else? Yeah, YouTube. I recently refired my blog. It's on a platform called Substack. It's completely free to sign the mailing list. I post there all the time. I post little lessons and ideas and all kinds of stuff. So, yannickwasdala.substack.com. Of course, my website. All the tour dates are there. I'm on tour with Steve Smith and Vital Information this year, 40th anniversary tour. Um, I have a new album coming out uh, towards the fall. I'm touring in Europe in November going down to south america in august so all the tour dates and all the information always there the books i'm kind of shutting the bass studio down i think we probably should have talked about that maybe that's for another episode in another life um but yeah that's it on. Uh, yeah sure anytime yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah Wicked. all right um did you say your website name as well yannick was so many consonants two vowels and just <laughs> so many consonants <laughs> thanks mom thanks dad <laughs> <laughs> okay guys take it easy we'll All see right, you next time easy. yannick thanks a lot mate bye it was yeah, such a you. treat yannick thank you man yeah